The views expressed on the following program are those of the host, guests, and caller. They do not reflect the views of this network. Thank you. Let's come up. We're getting we're a little late today. Coming up on the program. We hope everybody's enjoying it. We hope everybody's hearing it. We hope everybody's having it. We hope everybody is enjoying themselves. And without further ado, our guest is already here, so let's go right up to the guest. There's no news anyways. Um, so we are here live with Angela Teresa today. Angela, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, let's first start, as I always ask, how and why did you get into this field? I kind of started when I was a, a kid, uh, just in general, because I, I kept telling people things that I seemed to know, and they told me I was weird, <laughs> but I just couldn't quit saying what I was feeling or seeing. And uh, it kind of turned into, as, as I got older, people would ask me, you know, what do you think is going on and stuff. Like that. My mother did the same thing, though. She called it intuition. And um, it kind of turned into a thing, especially when I got into my teenage years, because, you know, I'd be hanging out with kids and they'd say, you know, I learned how to read palms and stuff just because I thought it was interesting. And found out I didn't really need those things, but I learned how to do all of it, you know, read tarot and all that. But I found that I could read through them. Like, they just kind of were a guide, and it got better and better. It's like a muscle, I think, that when you know things. And I, th I think everybody can do it to some degree, but it's a matter of learning how to, um, you know, pick up what the symbolism means. And that's how it gets better. I teach it. I've taught classes in it for people uh how to you know figure out the symbolic things for yourself etc and you know i'll do like a 12-week course i still teach courses um and i love to do it i've written a couple books that are on amazon they're more towards the law of intention uh which is my goal but they all kind of go hand in hand uh i find <laughs> nowadays and as i grow spiritually psychically um you know i the readings get better that's what i have found at least so i got started like i said kind of as more of a hobby or something i just kind of did and then when i was in my early 20s and i moved to new york uh, a woman kind of you know everybody knew i could do these kind of things and i generally did them and we went over to i remember in manhattan in new york we went to the mid manhattan library and springtime and i read for her and she goes you're really good at this and i'd been told that i picked up things past present future and uh people had told me through the years that stuff i said was you know going to happen in the future would uh that was certainly happened for many years and she said here you go and she handed me i think a 20 dollars bill she goes you should be paid for this and then after that she says, you know, don't, it's, it's a gift and people get paid for their gifts because I also, you know, do acting, et cetera. And I get paid usually sometimes <laughs> acting can be up or down. And she said, you should, uh, you know, you have a right to be paid for it. And uh, then you get, you know, as the time goes on, strange things with it comes to psychic stuff. There's people said you shouldn't be paid for it. Well, the reason that came up, that was, from many years ago, back in the old, old days, I mean, if you want to go back even to the ones who followed the Bible, uh, which is, a, you know, a fine thing, they were against uh, soothsayers, people who were liars. And I'm more along the lines, if you want to talk about, and I'm not saying I'm like that, but I'm not saying I'm not either. We're more like prophets. We're not, we're not soothsayers, depending on what your gift is. It's just the gift I was born with, and I'm sure for a reason. And back in the day the prophets those kind of days or any near you know, people were paid they were paid in different ways be it gold coins or they were given a house or they were given a place to live in a lot of the villages like back in the bible type days they would be given our chickens you know like if you do a reading for me i'll give you 12 chickens that will add to you being able to have eggs and food etc in your farm and that would be your payment. So it was whatever the form of trade was, or they would pay for your house. Uh, there was, there's actually a semi-modern uh, psychic who's, who's gotten out, but let's say in this, in the 19, you know, 1920s, 1930s, maybe a little later, he lives, uh, he was known in Brazil. Uh, I was, uh, they made a film about his life and um, 
I think he had lived until the 1970s or 80s. But anyways, he lived in a, a town in Brazil, and he was supposed to, he's very amazing. It's all a story. He did amazing things. But he, uh, they'll say he never asked for money. Well, he didn't, but he flew first class whenever he went somewhere because what they did in the village in Brazil, they provi- they paid for his house. He never had to pay electric bills or like that. He had a nice house, pretty much a luxury house, because the city loved him so much and Brazil was so proud of him. They paid for everything, so he didn't have to have an income because he he did his work for the people who came to him as they came to him, and he got his house paid for and his his luxury house, you know, indoor plumbing and everything. <laughs> it wasn't that ancient ago, so. Um, when I get people who would say, oh, you shouldn't, you know, get paid for this, I'm like, oh, no, absolutely, because if I were a homeless person living on the streets of New York, and it would be very cold right now, um, would you come to me? Would you ask me what I have to say about you if I was hadn't taken a shower in 10 years, you know? Uh, no, you wouldn't. You So you want to come to a psychic who knows what they're doing. Now, if I were just independently wealthy or you know, had a, somebody taking care of me all the time and uh, pay for everything and I could just do this at my leisure, maybe it'd be a different story. And I certainly have, you know, worked for free with friends and stuff like that on occasion. Uh, but sometimes they also just, you know, trade out skills or buy me a meal uh, or several. And um, that's, that's kind of how that started with the payment. And also just to let people out there knowing who do want to visit uh, psychic fairs, psychics, people, you know, go by how you feel about them. We all have different techniques. And uh, I don't give you, uh, I certainly also give you answers to questions of, well, let me tell you how I read, if you want me to keep going. Do that. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to quickly answer who who are these people that say that this is not a profession that you should do this for free. I I, I always <laughs> thought, like you said, shamans and all that were yeah. given free room and board, or they had expenses paid, like a minister. They would give them the house, and they. Yep. And I Does always thought the shamans and stuff were the ones, or the the oracles as they call them i guess you would say yeah. in certain myths were already rich people they were already people that had stuff or they lived in a cave and they knew where the gold was in the mountain and they knew you know excellent point and they did some of them chose to live that way there was a time when people were nomads or lived out you know because i come from a long line of uh well i make a joke about that but I, i'll try to keep it out of the joke thing at the moment I come from a long line of Irish people, the gypsies of Ireland, you know, we were travelers. So there was times in our history, which it probably came from that, uh, the genetic history there, is that a lot of them were soothsayers, so to speak, or natural psychics. And they traveled and lived in their vans or whatever they built, you know, they had wagons, etc. So they were kind of the people who, they would do it for trade, as you were saying, oracles. And when they went into a town as any gypsy would so they started getting a bad connotation you know they may not they weren't the romani uh and the romanis also have the you know the culture and the romanis uh they they went into towns and they did readings for people but yes they had like you said they would be given they they lived a different kind of lifestyle but the lifestyle was what they preferred and people would give them trade pots and pans you know whatever they felt they needed at the time or asked for or the person had to give but there is a, a lot of religious sex, and I'm not saying S-E-X, you know, S-E-C-T-S, sex, that felt that um, if you were given this gift from God, that everything is a gift from God or from whatever power you believe, um, is that you're supposed to give it away for free. But, you know, Jesus didn't, if you want to follow the Bible, uh, and Jesus walked around, he didn't starve to death. You know, he was giving his ministry, as you were saying, his ministry as a Jewish man. They fed him. They washed his feet. They gave him the things he needed for the times to keep him clean. They gave him a place to sleep. So it wasn't, he wasn't even doing it for free. Technically, he was giving his information for free, his experience and what he understood. But he didn't sit there and ask you what religion you were or how much you were going to pay him. No. But he also said, I could use a meal. He was a human being at the time. 
And, you know, he lived to be 33, he wouldn't have, or 32, he wouldn't have lived that long if he had not, if he had stayed today. So, you know, he was being fed, because how else did he make a living? Did he make a living? You know, he made whatever the living of the day was, and his way was to minister to the people, and then the people would provide him with the meal, or, you know, kill the chicken, or whatever they did, to uh, keep him satisfied, give him a place for the night to sleep, because he, he was, you know, walking around technically as they say, you know, wearing his robe, or in the death. But he would have died of, you know, exposure if he hadn't done that. Uh, and, you know, he, he died hanging on a cross, so they, uh, and they killed him, and that's what they did, they kept him in prison and fed him. So whatever the case is, he was paid for his trade in some way or another. So, yes, I'm not, and secondly, uh, well, depends on how you look at it, but, you know, if we're just like the people of that day, whether you think we're a prophet or not, but that's how they got money. And as you said, people like uh, even Joseph, who was a prophet in the Bible, right? He was in prison for a long time and they turned away. But uh, they, the who was it that paid him? And because he could interpret dreams, he got lots of uh, Joseph and the technical. Well, but he, he also Jesus is a very poor example. He was God. He could have made his own food. He could have gone into another realm. There are stories of him traveling to India and 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 just self-willed himself there it but, depends uh, on what you believe see i believe we're all god but that's a yeah. that's a different that's but religious like you said these people were taken care of they weren't out there to fend for themselves they weren't but even you know. if you re when you read the bible as you know it's not a poor example because you do read about the people he said be careful who yeah. knocks at the door that child that hungry child you're feeding may be him because, you know, that comes down to, I was a Sunday school teacher, <laughs> but it comes down to, like, eat people like him. And there were many people like him in that sense that traveled around and did ministry, et cetera, including John the Baptist, right? They washed feet. They did what they did, which was all considered of service. And they were paid for their services in some way, whatever era you're in. I, I can even go back to medieval times. Now, you know, you talk about, now, Robin Hood took from the rich and gave to the poor. Well, that's what it is. They weren't, the rich were supposedly could, of the stories of the myth, whatever it may be, with Robin Hood in the medieval times that the poor were starving to death and dying while they were farming the land to give it, and the rich were taking it away from them in taxes or whatever, take away their chickens. They couldn't survive. But if they had a gift, whatever it may be, and a couple of the Robin Hood stories have a witch in it, well, you know, how did they make money? Uh, they uh, they are how did they survive if they were somewhat human you can't just survive on you know love and people's appreciation it's nice to have it but you know again if i'm sitting in the streets of new york or underneath the subway or in the subway tunnels uh you're not going to get a very good reading because if i'm hungry and you know i'm going to be more like a rabid you know a rabid animal if i don't get food and don't feel good and you wouldn't want to come near me if i smelled like somebody would smell in the subway so i don't that myth came from a lot of the religious people when they were i guess killing people's witches and whatever they were doing that they felt that you were blaspheming the gift you were given but then name me a gift that isn't somehow compensated aside from what you use for yourself and your family uh and even that you're still compensated for it is, you know, you're compensated in some way or another. You, you learn to be an artist. You may have a natural gift to be an artist, but you certainly, you know, there's, there's actors who don't make a lot of money, but you also, you know, actors who are on the latest and get a million dollars worth a movie. Uh, and some of them even hit people at the Oscars. That's another story, <laughs> but you're not, you know, they're not starving to death. That's for sure. You're not going to look at Brad Pitt the same if he's, well, he's kind of thin, but better example, you're not going to look at somebody like Will Smith and say he's a poor child anymore. He, he had some money, he blew up, but he's a millionaire or a billionaire. And, you know, you look at these movie stars and go see their movies. If they were starving to death and look like the third world country, unless they're playing that type of role, you know, you're not going to go see them or find, you're not going to find somebody in India starving to death or whatever country where they have that happening and make them into a movie star unless you pay them and feed them and make them, you know, bulk up or something. So it's like anybody who has an art or a gift, you may have a gift for acting or a gift for singing. You may have a beautiful singing voice, but if you're sitting in some backwood country out in the middle of 
you know, some third world country where you don't eat and eventually you get too weak to sing anyways, what's your gift doing for anybody other than you entertained until you drop dead? Uh, so, and I'm being extreme, but that's what I'm saying is that when we have a gift and people who have that opinion, and I run into them, that have called me on it, you shouldn't give it away. You lose your powers. No, do you lose your you would more lose your powers if you get sick and weak and don't eat and don't have a home and don't have warmth than well, during the winter you catch pneumonia and die. Or we have our first caller. Hey. Caller, welcome to the program. Hey. Yeah. Hello? My name's Julie. Okay, welcome to the show, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi. you have a question for our guest tonight? Well, I'm just trying to get my earphones in. I just turned your show on. Okay. For some reason, there's some lag here. There's going to be a lag in the, uh, the, the, the thing. I don't know how to do that. I think Facebook does it. However, if you talk and answer your question, she can hear you and you can hear her. At this point, I haven't heard her. I only heard her say... She's Julie. Yeah. However, if you talk and answer your question, you can hear her. Well, I guess they hung up. Well, they can hear us. I heard her for a second. Yeah, Yeah, we can. What happens with this phone system, folks, is that she can hear you and you can hear her. It's all going into the phone system. Both people are going into our phone system. So both people can hear it. The mixer is the one that's controlling it. So I don't know why people are not hearing stuff. I can hear you. I can hear them. There there Um, may be a lag, as you said. I'm going to put them also, well, depending on what I hear, what you hear, uh, you know, we're going to try to, you know, do the, uh, you know, stick to kind of one topic or one question or two at the most. I have a tendency to... As you know, I can go on a tangent, which is fun, because a lot comes out. Yes. It comes to me very quickly, that's why. Now, what kind of readings do you do? Do you do tarot readings? Do you do psychic readings? Do you do well, energy? Do some, or natural spiritual readings. Uh, I would say that my readings are more along the lines of, now I call him a Neville Goddard. He's a, he's a person who did uh, practice that, uh, that we're all part of the God system, so mm-hmm. to speak. But what I'm saying is that what the way the gift has always worked for me i can do so i can do palmistry uh if i'm near you uh because i have to see your palm but um i pretty much go beyond that what i do is i see kind of like a movie or pictures in my head um which is part of the practice anyways of the person i'm thinking about and it will have a an image or it's kind of like interpreting dreams in a way but it's dreams that i'm picking up from here being awake and seeing you so you'll ask me, let's say you want to aim on a question. Uh, I will pick up a picture of that. So, and I know the path you're on. And what I see is kind of like a Google's map. If you go to Google's map, you know, especially the ones where you can like see people's houses, it's kind of like that for me, you know, where you can go in Google Earth, let's call it. So the Google Earth map appears in front of me or in me, let's call it. And um, I see the path you're on. So I'm reading that path and I'm saying, oh, you live here, you do this. And, and I see the past up till now and the things that kind of happened. And I see this little map, the little you know green thing that I can narrow into, oh, you're living here. Especially, you know, I may ask you questions to clarify if I'm seeing correctly, but do you live in the East? Unless you've told me or I've asked. And then you'll say, yeah, I want to know if I'm going to get that new house that, you know, tell me about the new house. And then I'll say, yeah you have a new you're going to make a move and i will start seeing the months and they start coming up in pictures like a big bunch of maps popping on top of each other to narrow me into the question and then it'll feel right i guess you would call it right or i get a big yes on top of it it can come in all kinds of symbols and then i can follow that map now most people have about as any map would have I see the path you're on, but that path can go off to different forks in the road that goes off the other way, goes off to the left, the right. And usually I can see up to almost seven. Uh, most people have about five that are extremely 
that are clearer, and then they have about three that they're kind of on that they get the choice. The example I will use, I often use to tell people how it works, is that if I see you're on a path, this is why I can read for you, and no psychic can tell you when you're going to die, because that's a choice you make. I can give you an idea of the path you're on if it's leading to a situation that you may try to avoid, and I'll tell you how to avoid it if I see it, you know. So what happens is say, if I see you're heading towards this, so say I'm reading for somebody who does cocaine on a regular basis and they never come for reading. So that's my good example. So a cocaine head calls me and says, I just feel like a reading and they get one. Okay. So I'm following their path. The path leads to basically ODing and dying on the thing because they do cocaine every day and they do more and more every day. And that would be pretty much the path you would expect logically of a cocaine head. Okay, so the cocaine or heroin or whatever leads to this death. But they called me on their path. They have this little fork in the road where they decide to call a psychic who says, I see a path where you could get rehab over here on the West Coast. You live on the East Coast, but something tells me that you have an opportunity to go to this rehab on the West Coast, and that will be the one that cures you of this if you continue to follow that new path. And here's the opportunity. That path leads you in about three weeks. You're going to give or take, and I can be a little off on timing, but according to what I'm looking on the Google Earth map of your life, is that if you take that road over there to the one on the East Coast, instead of the one in Texas, but the one all the way in California, you're going to have a complete turnover, and you will no longer do cocaine or even want to, and your life will go on for, you know, up into your old age, into your 90s or 100, if, if you choose to. And then I give you a better path to go on, but based on your current reading, you're heading on a path that leads to the disaster, uh, possibly. Or you might be on a great path, and I'll say, keep on that path. You're on the right path. You're heading towards exactly what you wanted. So I, I generally deal with people and what they want. Are you moving something? Because I'm hearing some. Could they be, uh, could what you see and what they do are two different things, like the universe. Let's call it the universe. Could the universe change everything on both of you? Or is it a set thing where you see what the universe has for them and uh, hopefully they'll do it right? Well, I see the path that they're choosing, and this is my belief and what I've seen to happen through all the years I've been doing this, is that, yes, the universe is basically you. You are making... Everything that we see on the earth in front of us, especially here on this planet, is there might be other dimensions, and we're not getting into that at this moment, but let's say the dimension we're in, planet earth, what we know of as real life, let's call it what it is. So our current real life, everything you see is created by something. It was all invented, including the internet. You know, it was invented, invented, invented. So somebody invented that, and somebody got a billion dollars for it, as we know, Gates and all those people. And uh, we, do, we do create our, our life that way. So let's say that we don't think we can do any better than that we have to take drugs to try to forget our life because we don't like what we've created. That's, that's a problem. And you've created a situation where you're trying to leave this dimension because chances are that is a, a slow suicide or a fast one. People commit suicide. Again, that's a choice. You can choose not to take yourself out. Um, yes, there is mental things that happen, but why are you choosing that? So, and we know that there's people who get help for that. So everybody's, from what I believe, the universe is not going to change unless you change it. So the path you're on and everything you see in front of you, you did create in some way or another. You couldn't, I mean, I believe we pick our parents before we get here, but whether you can get a family of people in the same family and they say they have three kids one becomes a serial killer because they're all treated badly one becomes a, a professor and one becomes you know cures cancer you never know what's going to happen with those people because that's all by the choices the same the three kids raised by the same parents can turn out completely different than each other and often do uh because of just choices they made when they ran into a situation where it was offered to them or not offered because you hear about these genius kids raised in communities where they weren't allowed to go to school or could, couldn't because they're too poor. But one of them is a complete genius because they just understand things. And then as they get older, they're able to come out of it. As, you know, examples of certain movie stars. Oprah Winfrey was dirt poor and pregnant at 14 years old and had a miscarriage and wasn't meant to amount to anything. But she always showed gifts. And she came out of being dirt poor in the South 
as a, a African American person and became a billionaire. Why? Because she made choices based on what was ahead of her. She said, "This is, you know, her baby died. It wasn't didn't come to fruition all the way. And then after that, she never got pregnant again." She said, and her father gave her some advice. She talks about it in her books, and um, you read about that. So if she can do it, as she said, and she's correct, anybody can do it. It's just a matter of what decisions you choose to make. So I think the universe, and I believe and know, the universe is you. You are your own universe. So we create based on that. There's sometimes, you and I have been through this and going through it sometimes, there are holdups, but that's what faith is about. And being that you, you come from a, a Christian background, which is perfect, that's what faith was about. That's what the Bible is about. You have to believe it's already true and that you are covered, that you are protected. And I believe we are. So the universe is God, is the, but we are too because we came here in these bodies, which a friend of mine calls the meat suit, to our soul came to experience as an experience of God, just like even it says, again, Sunday school background, Jesus said, you too can do everything I have done and even more. So if he came into being the son of God, as people have said, he said, you too are the son of God. That is absolutely in most Bibles that are written. You too are a a soul, the God soul inside a human body. That's not that's not a mistake. That's all throughout the Bible. All there's also people that believe that God, uh, I guess, made us in His own image, so we would have to be a God or of a, a yes. higher creature than than the rest. And we are higher than angels. We're higher than animals. Yes, we are correct. Now. I don't believe I have a big flowing white beard. I don't believe I can sit on a throne, but maybe right. maybe at that time. Um, if people are trying to call in, remember to call in and stay on hold until I get to you. A lot of times I just tried reaching the phone button over here, and the people hung up. you got to stay on hold. You're in a queue system. I know you. I see you. I may not be able to just jump right in when you call. So try it again. Our phone number tonight to call in to us is 607-238-3816. Also, when you call in, try very hard to keep uh, the, the background uh, down. Now, when you call in, I, uh, people are telling me there's a phone problem. I don't see it here with all of my equipment. My equipment has Angela on it. My equipment has me on it. I can hear you. If you can't hear me, then it's just simple pausing. That's fine. Let me know you're pausing. Um, the last person that just tried calling in was not pausing. When I picked up the phone and I asked them who they were, you could hear a lot of stuff in the background, and that's all it was. It was absolutely uh, nothing in the background. The other person tried to call. I would like her to try to call back in. Uh, something happened with her phone, and uh, that that is the, the some of the cases here, folks. But please do call in. Angela will do a, a you know few seconds of a reading the best she can for you. Or if you have questions, if you want questions answered. Um, and we're not going to take very many breaks today. We're just going to go right into our guest. I don't like the breaks. I'm out of breaks. I'm out of advertisements. Most of the contracts have ended. If you want to advertise with us, my email is cwlawrence01 at gmail.com. C-W-L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E-01 at gmail.com or you can go up on my website it's there uh we have some news of where i was this weekend that will be up on the website as well um uh, and we can talk about some of these things because i have a few questions for angela about experiences i experienced this weekend um on the uh thing it is i am brotherwade.com i am brotherwade.com you can go right to our podcast section all of our uh, archives are there and everything is there. So, again, if you're having problems on the phone, I know you're calling. And we're going to try to get to them as quick as they come in. But we just want the guest and myself to finish our sentences before we go ahead and answer the phones. Now, if you're in there, I cannot see the chat room tonight. Angela can. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody that's on here. I can see here there's coffee on this side. There's Michael on this side. There's our friend Donnie is here on the YouNow side. I am on the YouNow chat room. I cannot see the Facebook chat room. I just tried, 
and I cannot do it. Suzanne is there. We're saying hi to everybody. If you want a shout out for me to say hello to you, you have to come every week. I know Tim is going to be there. Uh, is there anybody on your side, Angela, that uh, you can say hi to tonight that I well, can't I, see? I can see Mike on Facebook, and he's the one who said hello. Uh, and I don't see anybody else. He said hello to you, actually, so I guess he knows you. Yeah, uh, Yes, a lot of these people are local people that Mike know me. Brown, yeah, Mike Brown said hello. Uh, he's in, oh, there's a Frank Blankenship. Oh, wait, can we do a column style to show? Oh, that was earlier. Yeah. Frank, uh, Watson, or Frank Blankenship. Uh, Holly Hawthorne uh, was asking about call. Holly, yes, give a call because we're on now. And there was Timothy Dixon. These are all, I guess, when we first were they, on. They are all the regulars. They are the ones that we say hi to every Here's week. Said hello. Uh, this was earlier, so these are the ones kind of before we started this thing. Now, now let's Holly, go. Hi, Holly. We're doing okay. Now let's uh, go into what happened this weekend. I went to Rolling Hills Asylum in Bethany, New York. I think it is one of the top five haunted places in New York State. While I was there, we were on a uh, woman's floor, or what used to be the nursing home side, I believe. Now, there was a time when I stood there, and I could have sworn. Now, now I know in my head. You saw the woman there there when you were there? Uh, Well, I, I knew there was nobody standing there. But in my mind, in my mind's eye, in your yes. whatever consciousness that you use for imagination, I'm not too sure what it's called. Imagine. I knew there was a lady with a walker standing there. I knew there was a gentleman next door and another lady behind them. Yes. Like maybe they were out on an outing and they were coming back to their rooms. Now, I believe that old lady had nodded to me. I believe that there was a lady there with a walker. Now, I didn't physically see her like a human being. I can't uh, reach out and touch her. Um, but I knew it in my head that somebody was standing there, that feeling, that uh, whatever feeling. Now, maybe the feeling of an old woman was because of where we were, I don't know. Um, but that was the only time during the whole place I saw this. Now, Angela, what would that be in me? Would that be psychic? Would that be a spirit trying to communicate? Would it be just me trying to imagine things because at that time, uh, you know... I had wanted to see something so bad, or what What would that be? Well, I would see that you were definitely uh, seeing spirits, but I, I do think that is your, your gift of how you see it, because that's how I do it. It's, it is imagination. It's just knowing if the imagination is giving you a true picture, because, and knowing that it does, it does, when you are looking for it. So we were talking earlier about intention, so that absolutely is what happened. Your intention was to see what you could see there. And because of that, you opened up your your mind to that. So you were able to use that gift to see what you needed to see about the place. So you saw this woman, and if you c- continued with it and this person going on an outing, you could have got more information. You may still be able to get more information just by going in there and saying, okay, what is it you want to tell me? This is what I would teach in my classes. Um, and uh, so what you would do is you would just, whatever you feel coming from them, they may start showing you pictures too or feelings. So if you start saying, what do you want to tell me? And when you did it, by the way, I went with you. So I saw her immediately. Uh, she was from an era before it was an asylum. So uh, this was not asylum, people. Uh, now, when you say you went with me, just for people, you did not physically go with me. You went no. spiritually with me. Absolutely. Just now, when you explained the story, that's what I do. I yeah. kind of go with you. So what happens, I went with you and what you were telling me the story, so I was feeling it with you. And so I immediately picked her up. Uh, I picked her up stronger. She's the stronger of the two. You said you saw two. You saw the couple. Well, I saw a woman like in a walker. And then yeah. behind, kind of next to her, there was a man. And then behind them, it's almost like, it, I don't know if people have been to nursing homes. I used to volunteer one when my great-grandma was in a nursing home. She died at 104 years old, by the way. Congratulations. Um, the nurses would take the patient's places or down to an activity or even the you know psychiatric place that I worked and they would stand behind them and let them you know kind of lead it, 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 it reminded me of a group coming back from something whatever it was medications something maybe she was distributing medications and they were all in the hallway I don't know um, 
and it was sudden and then as I continued to look and I even have my camera in that direction which I'm going to try to post the videos of there was absolutely nothing there anymore it was quick it, it yeah. was a sudden there it is and that's what happens to me yeah it's it I saw it's happened four times to me over the 21 years of paranormal investigating it's sudden and it's right there and if I don't remember it and I don't pay attention to it this time I happened to yell hello and there was nothing there so my hello disturbed the rest of my mind. And, of course, with my paranormal investigating, I want to make sure that I'm doing it right. I want to make sure yeah. that everything's in line and happening correctly. Well, you stop it. Um, You've been stopping it when it continues because there was something there. And when you're telling me that, I am getting that the person in the wheelchair was from the asylum, yes. And stand, the woman standing behind that, behind that, was from a different era so i'm getting that there was something earlier too they were not associated with the person in the wheelchair so you actually got several dimensions or several lifetimes not dimensions necessarily of people so you you do have the gift to see things now you have you're going to work on it i'm post, i'm working with you anyways on that uh i know we trying to with our schedules we have a caller caller welcome to the program yeah. <laughs> hello caller Caller, are you there? Maybe the caller's not there anymore. Is it Michelle? I have no idea. But I, I wish they Michelle would stay still. on the... The next time they call, I'm just going to hit the button and say we have a caller. Yeah. Because something... something either People don't know how to take their time to wait. I would hate to see if these people were in a grocery store and they want to check out. Do they immediately just put their stuff up on the counter or do they wait in line? Yeah. Anyways... Well, so, and here's something else. I felt like I was being watched, but it wasn't uh, physically watching. It was more of that watching feeling that you know that maybe a camera was, but there was no cameras. Right. And it was eerie. It was... Um, yes. Oh, there was several people watching. I, yes. I wouldn't use the word eerie, but I would use the word where I was not alone, but I was alone because there was nothing there. It was a blank room, a blank hallway. Yeah. My friend and my fiance were in the other room. There was nobody was with it, me. Not even my own no self was with me, really. I just kind of yeah. relaxed and said whatever's out here. I wasn't going to be afraid of nothing. And if it was something out there, well, it was an asylum. I, right. What am I going to do? Is, There's psychos the here, you know? Still there? Is the building still complete? Oh, well, for the most part, the lady takes care of it very nicely, I thought. Oh, that's good. Um, no, I, 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 I kind of got the opinion that stuff was set up. It's almost like a museum in a way. Nice. Um, however, some of the stuff I thought, I, you know, you walk in there and you're like, you know, they never, they wouldn't have had the room set up like that, obviously. However, you know, the cards on the table were, you know, modern cards. The games were kind of a modern game. But it was set up like it was a gaming room for people, for you know, whoever wanted to play games, whoever was having an activity there, whoever was in the day room. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of I'm a museum you, in going back says, in history. I will check back with you on this, but I got something. That, I asked him to send me text in the thing, and I got some. So Holly Hawthorne has asked, I've been having some experiences that have been happening on and off since my mother-in-law has passed on, and it's been driving me nuts, though. I'm not sure why this is happening. Um, your mother-in-law, okay, uh, well, she's trying to let you know that she's not really dead, because they're not, you know, the soul carries on, I wanted you to know that, Holly, uh, she's been trying to, uh, off and on since she passed, you can ask her not to do it that way, first of all, number one, ask her not to contact you that way, because it is driving you, it's, it's upsetting you, you can take a minute, when, if it continues to happen, and even if it doesn't, you can ask her to contact you in your dreams, and try to remember your dreams. Maybe put a notebook or something near your uh, your bed, and when you wake up, or if you wake up in the night, write down whatever you need to remember, or record it on your iPhone or on your phone. And I've done that, where you record something on your phone, you wake up in the night and say, "I had this dream, or somebody said this to me," because I've heard things before. I've fallen completely asleep, and see what it is she needs to tell you. Generally, uh, just a cookie on spirits and ghosts. Ghosts for the most part, do not know they died, so they wonder why you're there in their land. That's just general. And spirits do know they've died, 
Uh, my feeling is, is that your mother-in-law is, she might be a little confused. Uh, did she pass away with some kind of uh, dementia or something like that? Because I'm getting some confusion with her. Uh, and how long ago did she pass would be a question I would ask. So doing that, I don't feel she passed that long ago. So she might still be what we call in transition. When they're passing on, especially with any kind of mental disability or confusion, like a dementia, my mother died of, with dementia, or with, um, and she died in September, my mother did. And so I'm finding now that she's getting clearer and clearer in my dreams or communication with me because she's getting on the other side. Time is a little different, but she's getting clearer about what happened to her. So first she was what they call cocooning. As Wade was saying earlier, it's not like we were on the throne and having white beards or robes, but when we're on the other side, our soul is just in some kind of, you know, situation where it's not covered by this meat suit, this body. So you are aware of people you've known in, in the past and loved ones that have passed on beyond you. And some of the angels, which are a different level, might be kind of protecting you and helping you transition into the other side. But they are different than human souls. So what happens is the human souls that your mother-in-law knew, if she had any kind of disorder, she uh, they're helping her understand what happened to her. And then when she becomes aware, she can communicate with you much better through dreams or if she's trying to do it when you're awake and it's bothering you, tell her to stop it. Because it's, uh, it's not, I know it's not upsetting you in a bad way. Uh, she is letting you know she's there. And that if you have any questions for her, you want to know how she is, they're always fine on the other side. Once they get through it, unless they're in a cocoon situation, they're not unfine. They're just waiting. Like Princess Diana, many of you who remember when she died, she, she was very confused because she died in a, horrendous and very unusual way in the sense that she was like shocked that she was dead so they said she was cocooned for a while and i learned that from another psychic who wrote a book about it but it was very interesting how she was cocooned because she was like she was asking for her sons and she wondered why they weren't there and then when she realized and it took a little while that she was killed in a shocking way like you said with uh you know the car accident it's the same thing now uh she wondering how the stream Oh, how she had the strength to go through her health problems. Okay, so let me say what Holly said. She did, uh, she said her uh, mother-in-law, yes, she was letting me know she's there, and I also am the one who found her. I understand. Oh, yes. So she wanted to say thank you for that. I got that immediately when I read that. And it's been five months since she passed, similar to my mother. Uh, my mother died September 18th. She passed in her sleep from a heart attack, and I found her October 8th. Yes, very close. My mother was September 18th which was 10 days before my birthday, which is September 28th. Uh, she did have some health issues. And I'm wondering how I, how I have the strength to get, how you have the strength to get through. Oh, she was helping you. So since she died of a heart attack, it was a little shocking because it's shocking that the heart stopped. But she, uh, and also the loved ones around you. The, yes, she's saying the loved ones around you have messages that they were trying to hold you up. I'm getting an idea that you have a grandmother who was holding you up and helping you get through it. Uh, she was helping you get through the loss and understanding it. You also do have a strong gift. You are a strong healer. So you're very comforting to people. Uh, also that you found her in a way comforted her as she made the transition. Uh, so she wanted, to, she wanted to thank you for that. You're, the the in-law wanted to thank you for that, that you found her. And I, I, I'm hearing her say that you said something to her. When you found her passed away, I don't know if you said a prayer or special words to her, but what you said to her, she said, was very comforting and helped her. She was a little scared as she was crossing over, and she's telling me that, no, it was a blessing. Uh, I'm hearing uh, a blessing. She's saying something about Bethany, and I don't know what that means, or maybe that's something in the prayer. It has a word that sounds like that to me, but I'm hearing the word Bethany or or if that's where it happened, at a place with the name Beth. It's just, because I'm thinking of, in Central Park, we have something called Bethesda Fountain. So I don't know if it was Maryland, which makes me think of Bethesda, or something to do that. But she had some, that was one of her messages about, tell her, you're Holly, so I know she's not calling, your name's not Beth, but she's going, Bethany, it was a, I want to say it's a prayer, like Ave Maria. So maybe it's 
something in a language, the name means something. I would look up the meaning of Bethany because I don't know the name offhand. I'm not Catholic anymore and it's been many years. Um, you told her I love her and I have her pastor. Oh, yes, the prayer. Okay, it was a prayer. Uh, and you had the pastor come do a prayer for her. So she said when she passed away, so people who are listening, Polly uh, found her, passed away, and she told her she loved her and she had a pastor come up to do a prayer for her. And what's happening now is the spirit of her uh, in-law here is telling me that she uh, she heard that and it comforted her because she was having a little, as she was leaving her body, she was a little bit afraid and she wasn't sure what to find, but the, the love, which carries on the feeling and everything, helped her cross over. And the prayer was very comforting along with her uh, her daughter-in-law. I guess her daughter-in-law was being right there with her. Uh, she really adored you too. You, she's uh, she really adored you. Uh, I'm getting like, are you the only girl that she uh, really had in her family? I mean, uh, I'm feeling like you are the daughter she wanted or had, or she had a maybe she had a daughter that passed on many years before. But uh, that's what I'm feeling. Uh, there's something with that because you feel like you're her girl, her girl. Um, and do you also have a daughter? Because I'm getting also a generation another child or a daughter unless it is i'm feeling that she had a baby that passed away or a daughter that passed away i'm not getting clear on that it's just coming to me very quickly now this is how things pick up with me very quick maybe that's the beth or bethany maybe she had a child that did not come to fruition a child who did not make it out of the womb or died you know a miscarriage maybe a natural miscarriage uh that she lost many years before because i am getting an earlier time uh, I'm getting an idea that was a baby and it wasn't, I don't feel very developed. So maybe she was a few months pregnant or it was stillborn, but I'm getting almost came too early. If it came at all, um, she could have miscarried very early on three months in maybe. Uh, and this may not be a known fact. Sometimes I get this. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, so you have, so Holly has a son and her son has a daughter. So she's talking about knowing the, about the daughter. Is the daughter about four or five years old? Am I getting that right? It feels like four or young or when she passed away, the child was in that age range. But I'm getting something with the, the girl um, being very young. I'm still getting about five. Uh, I don't know if she's five now. Uh, no, okay. But I'm getting something about five years old uh, that and maybe five months old because they grow up on the other side, by the way, even if she had a daughter of her own many years ago, which also pops up in this idea that her daughter maybe have grown up on the other side. And maybe when she got there, she was about five. Uh, oh, so her, her husband's daughter is nine. She does know about all the girls. She's talking about the, there are girls, but you are, were you her, her daughter, the, the only daughter she had like an in-law? Is that correct? Holly? Um, that she's not sure yeah uh at least among the ones that she knew of living but uh she's talking about you being like the daughter that she wanted or well she wanted to so maybe if she had a daughter of her own that didn't survive very long she wanted a daughter like you she felt like you were really there for her and you were because you said you just see her when she passed on so that's a but her message is thank you thank you for it's a blessing to her and she is she's making sure that you have a lot of beautiful spirits that look over you and to let you know that they are there looking over you. And uh, I, you have a really strong grandmother thing around you too. So your grandmother, I, I'm feeling maternal. So I, I think it might be your mother's side grandmother if she's uh, passed on. And um, yeah, she's like looking over you. If it's not your grandmother, if she's still here, then it's the great grandmother, but there's somebody on that side looking over you because I'm getting very old fashioned clothing too uh, with that one as I got for, and I'm going to go back to Wade whenever, if we don't have other calls, but uh, yeah, you are the one she got close to. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the message I'm getting. If you have, uh, that she wanted you to know that, and it's going to work out. She did say that she's helping you with a situation you're in. So uh, yes, it is coming. And I think this message might be for both of you in a sense, but I'm getting an idea that there is something of uh, both grandmothers have passed. Yes. So I feel like your maternal grandmother is watching. They're both watching over you, but I feel like your maternal grandmother is the one who's really, really there for you all the time. Did she happen to pass away when you were a small child? 
So that might be the five-year-old thing or the young girl thing. Because if your grandmother passed when you were a child, that might be what I'm getting reference to. Because I get a lot of people telling me things. So uh, I'm not 100% sure, but that's a possibility. Um, and um, the message I'm getting for both of you and Wade, and this is not necessarily from Holly's grandparents, this is just in general, but I'm getting that you both have something coming to you when it comes to some financial fit situation getting better, both of you. There's uh, just some weight in general, you're, there's a financial situation that's gonna raise you up. So you will get your, your uh, way, you will get your um, sponsors, your people that are advertising, that's gonna pick up real soon and a lot. Uh, you're gonna get a good one. Uh, I might pass away when I was three months old. So there's the three months. So you were just three months in the womb. So maybe that's where I'm getting the young, the young girl, your grandmother on your dad's side. Maybe they were just trying to let me know. And that's how they also let me know. If I did a reading for you on the phone, as I just did now, um, they that's how they let me know who I'm talking to to confirm with you too that I'm getting the right the right thing. But your financial situation, Holly, is getting better. Are you up for a new job? I just want to know because they told me something about either a new job for you or a raise where you are, but I'm getting almost like a new job or a new situation. Uh, I don't know if you're looking for a new job and you may still get offered one, but if you're looking for a new job or want a job or uh, a better paying job, this is the time to look because you have a really good, really good chance right now of uh, getting something started this spring before spring ends. I would say uh, by, you know, April next month, we only have a couple days left of this month anyways. So it feels like you have a good thing coming. And if you, you know, want to do the $47 full hour reading at some point, yeah, definitely send me an email. I put it in here a couple times. So, um, yeah, I've been struggling with uh, your money. Uh, many people have, but definitely, I feel like for you, yeah, it's been big. Hang on, I hit something and it went. Uh, the odd thing is, I remember her like it was yesterday. Yeah, and you are looking for a job. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get something. You're going to get a job quite soon. I feel that it's very bright for you. Very bright. Are you in the? Are you here in New York? Is is Holly one of your friends? Wade, is she here? No. I believe she is. Yes. I, yeah, I, I, I'm I not she, sure where, but yeah, I'm a lot of. Pick up for you, Holly, around the Maryland area. So I don't know if you're have any ties to Maryland, but that just picks up with you a lot. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Oh, okay. And just for the well, record, you're talking. We're talking to people in our chat rooms, and if anybody yes. wants to join our chat room, that might hear this in the archives. That's what I'm reading. Every yeah, I'm week reading. we have a uh, archive chat room here, oh. and we try to get uh, everybody in it. Now you can go up to my Facebook, you can go up to you now, you can go up to our uh, thing, and uh, it's not. Uh, I gotcha. It's uh, uh, there, so. We have them now. Uh, yeah, she lives in uh, Owego now. Everybody likes to know where Owego is. It's a historic town, by the way, and it is haunted. I've been there twice to the two. Uh, I don't know if Holly's cool. ever been to the. Um, I guess the Indian was on. It, she wasn't from the graveyard, but she was passing through in a train. There was a train accident, and they buried her there. Um, I forgot her name, but she's buried in the famous Owego Cemetery there. I've been to all four of the cemeteries, and we did get some uh, EVPs that are on my uh, that we will be putting up on my webpage. At one of them, um, Holly uh, should get involved with my meetup. I have a meetup for paranormal investigations, and this weekend kind of sparked me into maybe even starting another podcast or a show or something for paranormal again. I ran a paranormal podcast for almost 10 years. Um, it was uh, great. If you want to call in, 607-238-3816. Uh, Angela's uh, email is angelora28 at yahoo.com. You can have a private reading with her. And this is what I'm going to talk about now. What What is these private readings? Can you explain to the audience what goes on in these readings? Because a lot of people hear the private readings. They're not actually coming to you. They're not actually sitting down and having coffee with you. No. What would a private person. reading be? What What would it be? How does it happen? I'd like to go a little bit into it and talk about it so people know what it is and, and, and a little bit about yourself with doing these. What what is it? 
Uh, well, it's very much like we just did with Holly, except for we could maybe get more personal depending on the person and their privacy because you'd have privacy. You're on the phone with me. Uh, I have a phone. You can also, I can do it on Zoom if you want to see me, although I, I don't know that I'm always that presentable. <laughs> I am, but I'm not because uh, I don't have my makeup on. But uh, sometimes face-to-face -face is fun for both of us. Uh, I can do also FaceTime. Uh, so it, it just basically means one-on-one -on -one with me on one of these ways, one of these options in this time. If you are in the New York City area, just because right now, you know, and for what, what my prices are, you can come in person if you like, because I've met people at diners and done it in like a corner booth or whatever. Uh, but I am in the Astoria area or Manhattan. I would probably, uh, I mean, the farthest I would go probably would be Brooklyn or the Bronx. Uh, but it's also good if we can meet halfway. We can meet in Manhattan if you come into the city. For what, what is Astoria? The only place I've been recently to Manhattan was to that big, big hospital they have down there. Oh, yeah. And I got out of there really quick. I, I don't know what it is with you people having a hot dog stand on one corner and an ice cream truck on the other. What what? Do you the guys business. eat that much ice cream that you need an ice cream truck on every corner? Uh, I think that's just business for people trying to make a living. That just has to do with this time. But uh, And it's always been like that. You know, People are always trying to make their living doing their work. Basically free enterprise. Let's call it free enterprise. Uh, you got to get a license to do that, though, of course, in New York. Uh, that said, um, yeah, they put them everywhere because anywhere you can't get access to just sitting down. And, and of course, with COVID this past year, I guess it kind of upped a little bit because people can't really go sit in a restaurant for a long time. Um, that said, Manhattan is, uh, Astoria is in Queens. We have five boroughs, as people know. That is New York City comprised of five boroughs. And the five boroughs are Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, which I never go to, uh, although I've been on the Staten Island Ferry. Uh, which is a nice ride, and uh, the Bronx and uh, Manhattan. And there, that's three islands, and, well, four, actually, I guess, if you count Staten Island. And what about Long Island? Long Island is part of uh, Brooklyn and Queens is on Long Island uh, because it's one big giant thing, but there is Long Island as a different county. It's not part of the, uh, it's not part of the five boroughs, no. Let me see. I was a tour guide, so I better make sure I know that, but no, it's not considered that except for the part that's Brooklyn and Queens. Now, Brooklyn and Queens is connected on one island, uh, and that, that was going to be the uh, cemetery. That's why you see a lot of cemeteries in Queens. Queens is loaded with them because back when they were just building this place for the Dutch, they were here, they were gonna make, they were gonna put all the dead bodies of people who passed away in Queens, and they started a lot of cemeteries. There's a lot there. Uh, I'm, Astoria is also in Queens. The neighborhood is pretty much Greek. It's about 20 minutes from Manhattan, Midtown. If you come into Port Authority or Penn Station, if you get on a subway, you're going to be in Astoria, a very nice neighborhood. It's just Greek mostly, some Serbians and a lot of good food and a lot of Indians now with the Indian food, but mostly still Greek. It's still an old fashioned neighborhood in a lot of ways. The subway runs outside above, above our heads, you know, it's an L. So um, that's the cute the Q train still, or the N train? The and how far are you from where the ball drops, the, the, the big Times about, Square? About 20 minutes. 20, 20 minutes. Mm. Yeah. My exactly. uncle used to live in Manhattan, oh, well, in that area, but I don't know where he lived. He lived above yeah. a donut shop, whatever oh, that nice. tells me. How many donut shops are in New York City? I have no idea. Well, it depends on the time, but um, I used to live in Chelsea, which is not too far from Times Square, but... That said, I'm going to be working over near time where the ball drops. I'm going to be working right at the Madame Tussauds, right in that area, not too long from now, just a regular job I'm doing. Um, the Wax Museum, I take it. Yeah, uh huh the Wax Museum. But I'm actually working for a company that works within the Wax Museum, and it's a, where you, they take your photograph as you go by, and then if you, you want to buy it when you leave, that's up to you. But I'm working for the company that takes the pictures. I'm not taking the pictures. The You're not going to dress like Mario or in a snowman no. or something and go and get no, pictures I of people. Like dress kind of corporate. Like I'm more like a retail sales person, um, and that's cool. It's just some, you know, it's, in, it's regular income in between my reading. You should just go body. to Central Park and open up a table and start giving well, tarot I, readings. I look at Central Park also uh, during the spring. That should pick up pretty soon because the weather just got cold today, as you know. You're in the you're in a colder area than I am. We have snow on the ground. We have about, yeah, well, we don't anymore. It's kind of blown take, all around. Oh, I got you. I take photographs in Central Park. I do photography. 
Uh, I, I'm what I call myself a renaissance woman. I do a lot of things that I enjoy doing, but I love helping people in every way I can uh, because it's just fun. I like to meet people. Uh, so I will do readings in person. We're talking about my readings. Uh, I do them on the phone. I do them on Zoom. Uh, but my majority of my business has been on the phone because, you know, you can sit in your pajamas and talk to me for an hour. Uh, I also do past life readings or past life regressions which have a separate price, but if you want to talk about in your reading about past lives, I can do that, and I would I would charge the same. Um, you can so have what's, various- what's the difference in the two readings? Let's let when I say when you say past life, you actually mean the person was somebody else, or was the well, spirit somebody yes, else? Yes, yeah, I believe that you you live in different bodies, not the spirit. You're the same spirit every time, but you have different uh, personas. So let's say in a past life, and not that it's necessary because I don't meet that many famous people, but let's say, you know, in a past life you were, uh, like I was Robin Hood. Let's just, for a weird example. And just so, so you know, Robin Hood was real. There was a I, real Robin Hood. Well, I'm with you too. I believe Robin Hood was real. Uh, no, was there was a real guy named Robin Hood that lived in Nottingham, England, yes. Well, um, he he fought the against the queen, but that story of robbing yeah. people and stuff wasn't real. That's right. I, I read the whole story of it. His name was Robin Hyde, and it was one word, and it was R O B Y N H O D E. And yeah. he was arrested for robbery in about, uh, I don't know, 10 something. But he's in the record books, you're correct, yes. And I did read about him. And, and he would rob the rich and try to take care of the poor people that lived in the area. Oh, but I, he didn't yeah. go, go around doing it as a regular job every day he like Hollywood made him out to be. No, that they made up and based on several different yeah. people of the era. They think he was based on Rob, uh, Rob Roy, and a couple. But there of is a real Robin Hood, and there was a Nottingham, so, England. I know there's a Nottingham, England. It's still there, Nottinghamshire, and but they said that the one who got arrested, the Robin Hyde, on that subject, uh, Robin Hood, Robin Hyde, he he actually lived in Barnstable, which is very close to Nottinghamshire. But he's not necessarily from Nottingham. He just happened to get arrested in Nottingham. For that robbery and because uh, the land changes a lot you know he's near the big oak of Sherwood Forest and all that stuff uh, that's where he was arrested at least. and if I'm not mistaken wasn't that uh, Bonds uh, Shire wasn't that in a Sherlock Holmes novels too yes yes it is Barnstable yes it's in uh, I believe it's in the uh, Ivanhoe Ivanhoe is the story of Robin Hood by the way and it's based on some true stories so they, they think that that's more close to the real story, Ivanhoe. It's, it's just like uh, what's I forgot the movie, but um, yeah, yeah, it's the true. Irish guy. It went up against the king too. There, um, Sean Connery and um, Marion and Robin. No, Robin? that it was a total another one. Uh, it's where the guy dressed his face blue, and it's the same guy. It went. Oh yes, and, yeah, Rob Roy. That was uh, yeah. Mel Gibson, and that was yeah. uh, That was not Rob Roy, but it was the. Uh, I love that movie, by the way. It's one of my favorite movies, which is... Uh, Brave, Braveheart or whatever it was. Braveheart. Braveheart. I love that movie, yeah. and that's based on William Wallace. That yeah. was William Wallace's story. But they Rob used... Roy is another one, too. That's And yes, if you yes. watch the Rob Roy movie, they I have did. two sword fights that were actually the guys were fighting each other with swords. So uh, if yes, they had cut each other in that scene, they would oh. have really hurt themselves really badly. Yes. I saw that, and that was good. Cause that, wasn't that Liam Neeson? I don't know, but one of them... The one where they're in the field, and he backs yeah. up. He oh, no, actually, yeah, he actually backed up because the sword went too close to his face, and he backed yes. up and guarded, like for real. Oh, that was not that was not a uh, planned uh, uh, thing. They were really the doing those two fights, um, yeah. and I think the other one was the the one where he had the bigger sword in his hand, and you could hear yes. the two swords clashing. And at one point. One of the swords looked like it was going to break because it did. It hit so hard it got loose in his hand. It almost fell out of his hand. Those are two of my favorite movies, by the way, of all yeah. time. I'm I, a big I, Robin Hood fan. I'm a big Robin Hood fan. I, I, uh, I thought you liked, what's his name, Tim Curry movies. I love Tim Curry, but he, did, uh, he didn't do Robin Hood. No, he didn't do Robin Hood. Uh, I wish he could have before he got sick. But uh, one He of did Legend. Uh, yes, he did, and I love Legend. That's a great movie. He was, he was the Lord of Darkness. Uh, the devil made me do it. I also love um, the other version of Robin Hood, when it's one of the best for anybody out there who's a Robin Hood fan, just getting into medieval times. So I know I lived in the medieval times, by the way. 
Uh, I read a lot of books from that. If era, you want to, so. if you want a Robin Hood to watch, you go watch uh, Mel Brooks's Men in Tights. I love Men in Tights. There you it's go. A, it's a hilarious movie. Uh, but my other favorite movie of the ones that are more true to source. I mean, I love the original, The Adventures of Robin Hood, with you know, with uh, uh, Flynn, Errol Flynn, because it's just fun. But uh, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite movies of on a more serious level, besides you know uh, stuff from medieval times, because I love medieval times. Uh, is the uh, Robin and Marion. Robin and Marion is Sean Connery and uh, uh, what's her name? Hepburn. And uh, not Catherine. The, uh, what's her face? Audrey. Audrey Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn and they play that uh, Robin Hood and uh, Maid Marion when he comes back from the Crusades. Because one of the books does say, uh, I think it's Ivanhoe, says he went to the Crusades with, uh, with King Richard. The, yeah, King Richard. And so the first, King Richard the first, he went to the crusade. So it's a very interesting book. But uh, back on the readings, because that has a lot to <laughs> that has a lot to do with stuff I see. But when I do past life, which is very interesting, and that's a good topic for that anyway. Uh, the medieval also had a lot of, as we know, magic and people, the Knights Templar all came from that era, and they were very psychic and also Stonehenge, and a lot of people who are into or who have psychic gifts that really come forward had lifetimes in that area of England. Uh, and you were in that era too, Wade. You also have a past life there. And, uh, well, see, a lot of people tell me I have a new spirit, whatever that means. I've been I, told by a lot of psychics people, I have a new spirit, and then one told me degree, I have a you, very old one, a, a, too old for her to old, go back. Yeah, you, but you, your soul itself is old. Most people today alive, very rare do we have brand new souls we have mostly uh old souls and the old souls everybody from what i can tell from what i've done at this point i have learned have anywhere from about 38 to about 62 lifetimes behind them as per this dimension okay i'm learning new stuff all the time so i would say as per the planet earth dimension that we are aware of at this point it's everybody's about 38 to 62 lifetimes and so sometimes they affect you based on the age you were in the lifetime when you passed away. And so that's why we develop certain phobias and things that we can overcome. And so what happens with past life regressions? I can do a past life reading that is not a regression, meaning I did what I just, you know, what you and I were just talking like. I could pick up past lives you had. That's what we were kind of talking about. If, if you were around. Okay, the here, okay, here's a challenge. What past lives did I have? I pick one. Well. You had the one where you were, I think, a Knights Templar, but I think you were also tied to Stonehenge, which may, they, from what I can see, they're almost tied for you together. So you may have had two lifetimes right in a row that were like, I don't know the era of Knights Templar compared, I know the era, but I don't Would know. Would that explain age. why I can watch history shows and be like, no, that's full of BS, that's not how it was? Exactly. You do what I do, yes, and I love history shows for that reason. Uh, you were Knights Templar and Stonehenge. Now, Stonehenge was um, Celtic in thing, and they don't know a lot about them. It's kind of mysterious, but so is the Knights Templar. But you were very much a fight. Uh, it was it's a very almost a religious order, but it was that religion of the Celtics of that era. Uh, you may have even you even have some ties to the Vikings, which came in from the Knights Templar. So you were Viking era into that i'd have to check the years on it but you can check that you probably know better than i do well i do have greenland ancestry yeah oh interesting but you also had a lifetime as uh like viking into the knights templar check out the ears of that and what about, about ancient the... egypt i can i can do that with a lot of egyptian yes, stuff a that... lot of that stuff. oh yeah ancient egypt of course osiris and I... Oops, sorry if i got a little messed up i dropped the phone do you have a tie to Osiris and Isis? Um, I don't know, but I, I can watch a lot of those stuff. Like, I know the pyramids. Yeah, I love the pyramids. And this is the the thing that bugs me the most. Yeah. Do people realize that back then a man could lift three, four hundred pounds? Just, just pick it up. So if you that. could get a bunch of people that could pick up four hundred pounds each, you got six of them. Or yes. three of them, that's a thousand pounds. So they just picked up a, a, a stone like it was nothing and walked it up the hill. They didn't drag it with a thousand people. No, no, they didn't have to, did they? I had a dream one time I was inside the pyramids while they were building them. I had, so that was one of my past lives also. Alistair Crowley saw his first vision inside of a pyramid. 
Oh, he did. Oh, okay. And that's yeah, where he I, got that being that looks like an alien. Have you ever seen the description of that being he saw? I've heard about it. I have not seen it. No. Yeah, it. If you uh, if you go look up it, and you look at that being that he saw, that to me reminds me of a alien, a oh, gray. When did Alistair Crowley pass on? I'm not sure. He had children. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure about that either. My my Check friend would know out. more about him. But I do know he stayed in a home and he sat there and had hashish and heroin. Yes. Yeah. And they saw visions and they uh, basically had orgies until they would pass out from a, a, a lack of. And he took a guy out in the middle of the desert and did things with him, but uh, that were unnecessary. Um, however, his story of going up on the mountain is where he almost died, and he came back down. And the reporter goes, "What did you? Where's the people?" He goes, "I ate them." Oh, I heard this story. But he yes. never ate them. He he almost died himself. He got frostbit. He got very sick. Yeah. And they said, "Oh, that he was the wickedest man in the world." He called himself the wickedest man in the world on purpose, just to cite people, just to get them on their nerves. Yeah, I knew he had some kind of. Um... What I know about him, I don't know much, but I didn't study him that deeply. But uh, he was uh, kind of a showman, like trying, like you said, making things what they are, just to see how the reaction would be, stuff like that. He died in nineteen forty-seven. He was born 47. in 19, 1875. Okay. At Royal Lanfin, United Kingdom, and he died in Hastings, United Kingdom. Hastings, okay. Um, I, I'm getting that there, you have some kind of tie with him during his lifetime. Not a, I don't think it was a long one, so I get the idea. That's why I asked if he had children. In one of his uh, you, in the YouTube videos, one of his, the YouTube videos mm -hmm. of him meditating would honestly open up something in your mind. It uh, would open up your third eye. He knew how yeah, he, to do this stuff. I heard that, yeah. And he had ties to Flame, uh, uh, Thalema, and Thalema? he had ties to the Golden Dawn until he was kicked out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had somebody, I knew somebody who was really into him. I've met a lot of people who do a lot of different things. But with the past life readings... I have I the a, book, Magic of Aleister Crowley. Oh, you do? Yes. But if I did a regression on you, yeah. which uh, I wouldn't do here, but if I did a regression on the phone, which I can do with people, a full regression, like I said, that's... Now, what, what is a regression? That is some psychic thing where they actually go into trances and... Well, it's not really psychic, but it, it's, it's relaxation. It's like hypnosis, some people say. Uh -huh. But what happens is, I'm not a hypnotist, so basically I give you a relaxation technique. And what I would do is, like, let's say whatever age you are now, I would uh -huh. start doing a life regression. So you would go back into being even in the womb in this lifetime and see when you become aware of things. You and I talked about this on a... Yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. So if I took you through nine months in the womb, you would have a, a certain idea. Uh, you might be inside the baby. You might be outside the baby. Uh -huh. you, chances are you would be in the baby by nine months in the womb. So I can take you to the birth experience, and I do. And generally, I take you to around that area, and then we keep going back, and we will go back to a lifetime, and I, I basically do the relaxation that leads you to a lifetime that is affecting you now. I talk you through it, because I can, and it's, again, it's kind of like hypnosis. I learned it in a hypnosis class, but it's still a relaxation technique. You'll remember everything, but you are kind of under a uh, relaxation place. You've seen it in, t if you watch any YouTube videos of people getting regressions, it's almost exactly like they do. It's just you're kind of relaxed where you are, and we don't get interruptions. Now, what happens if you can't get the person out of it? You always can. There's no reason you can't because you're here. You're here now. The only reason you wouldn't come out of it if you're ill, and I wouldn't do a regression on somebody who's ill, or uh -huh. if you're on some kind of drugs you shouldn't be on. And I, I did that once, and uh, it was hard. They were just high, but it was. It's not a good time to do it. You should, probably shouldn't be high when you do it because you want to have all your faculties. That reminds time. me of that traveling story that I was told about. Yeah. They went to the mountains or Africa or somewhere, and they um, the shaman refused to let one of them go with him. Yeah. And he said, it's not time. And all of a sudden, the guy took this drug again, and he had a really bad time. He, you know, shit his brains yeah. out, threw up, uh, almost threw up blood, couldn't see, was right. whacked all the hack. And finally, he came to, and the shaman goes, oh, you're ready. And what they found out was 
all of that stuff was releasing all the evil out of him because if he took him up this mountain to this sacred place with evil in him, whatever the spirits were were going to get him and he would have had a hell of a time up there. Yeah, and that's that's a, a topic I don't... I, I You know, I'm dealing with positive energy and all that. Yeah. Um, the evil thing is a, a whole another topic for another time. But uh, uh, I, I agree that you can't really do it when you're on something that is changing your mindset. No. Yes. He yeah. needed to be in a better state. Agreed. Because yeah. he would yeah. like throw up blood or whatever he would do. You don't want him to be that way. And that's what happened. No, but him. that's what the stuff was to make to do, to get all the evil out of you oh, so you, know, you could go. Oh, I see. That was yeah. a, that was so that, that was a that. good thing he did that because that's what they that, were waiting for, and he didn't do that. Everybody else went off on this bad trip. He was like, "Whoa, that was fun." Right. No, and it's I not supposed to be fun. All oh, right, and with the stuff I do, I don't want any trips other yeah. than the trip I'm leading you on. Yeah, I just want you to be on the trip to, you know, get. I don't. Some I don't think I've ever hallucinated on anything. I don't think I ever did anything. Yeah, I, it's what happened when I did a, a years ago when I was first learning how to do it. And I did a past life regression on somebody. And it was many years ago. She was high, you know, just toked up yeah, a little. But yeah, yeah. some people become paranoid when they're high. Yeah. And so when she went into a past life, see, she found out that because I go with you. Remember how I said I went with you to see the, yeah, the ghost? Yeah, yeah. Well, she saw my eyes in her with her eyes closed she could see me looking at her and she thought i was somebody else uh, and so she got all paranoid and it was hard to get her back i still uh, got it back but i didn't like the way her attitude so was what before. would happen if you left her there she would eventually find her way back because she would come oh, out of the high oh, and it would have been, oh. she may have but she may have forgotten everything she picked up because it's really when i'm doing it and when we do it is for you to pick up more about yourself. So it's kind of like an astro travel, like the the, yeah, uh, the yeah. Christmas carol is, where he took you back in time. Yeah, it's kind of like that. So you can, yes, it really is. It's kind of like so you can pick up more insight into yourself to help heal whatever is standing in your way now. Because all of this is done, all of this, including readings, is basically what people have a question and they want a better life. That's usually the reason they come to me or anybody who does the kind of things I do. You want to learn more about who you are and why you are when you have things that are, you know, causing our prosperity not to be as fluent. I can't read for myself as well. I have done self-regression into past lives because that, that can be done. But aside from that, knowing my past life, uh, sometimes doing a reading on myself, I'll go to a psychic myself that I trust or like uh, if I decide to do that. You ever and find do... any out there that are lunatics? Oh, yeah. Tons I mean, New York City must have a few ones that just want your money. Not just New York, all over the place. Yeah, in New York, definitely, but also Arizona, where I'm from originally. Uh -huh. I, I've known quite a few. And I've got some lunatics who even, you know, we I was in a group in New York called Seance from the City that was very interesting. And uh, we had somebody come in there talk about lunatics who claims to be one of the you know best psychics in America and the world, actually, I think. And he was on a couple of things and he was um he he actually looked a bit like you he wasn't like you but he looked like you the same build same type of look and he came into one of our seance in the city and at one point in seance in the city in the group uh run by somebody i know a good friend uh it wasn't really seances it was more like a meditation group we kind of did that you know messages that came from the other side and stuff like that but it wasn't like a traditional old-fashioned seance. It was kind of a more modern, like we do here on my phone calls and stuff like that. And this guy came in for the first time. We had never seen him before. And we did the thing. And he, at one point, opens up the circle for messages. If somebody has a message from spirit for somebody in the room, and we read for other people in the room. And he often had me read for people. And he also read for people, the guy who runs it, named Jesse. Well, the guy that kind of looked like you that came in the first time decided he was the best psychic in the world, better than any of us, including me and Jesse, according to his opinion, uh, he said. And he, we had a little girl come to the seance that day. She was probably 12 years old. And he started saying that she had somebody that died in 9-11 following her and that this person, this, the soul of this person was following her. Well, first of all, you don't give people that kind of information especially a 12 year old girl or a 12 year old child for that matter any child uh and was giving her this information that she has some kind of ghosts following her because first of all ghosts do not become your spirit guides for the most part or even spirits for that matter they might guide you and be around you like holly has her you know mother-in-law around her 
and her grandparents, they're there to help guide you, but they have their own things they need to do. Your soul has its own journey. And so they don't, they're not your, they don't become your spirit guide suddenly. I believe you have spirit guides, but they are a different kind of like angels. They're a different level. They might even be higher, but that said, they have their own job and they're not in human form. And they certainly didn't die in 9-11. So we- Isn't we, that how Sylvia Brown did something like that too? Sylvia Brown to some degree, although I know I knew Sylvia Brown a little bit. I didn't know her personally very well. I've talked to her a couple of times before she passed, but she, uh, she, her books are very good. For those who want to know about the other side, she, she has some very good stuff that is definitely true. Now, as for her readings, I, I can't say. She gave a ever. reading that some guy died and was drowned, and they said he died in 9-11, and she said, oh, no, really? it was in water. Wow. Huh. Oh, yes. I remember this. Yeah. She had quite a few that they said she wasn't very uh, accurate on. But I, I don't I don't think she ever went to Montel. Now, I'm not making fun of Montel Williams here. No, no, I understand. I don't think she went on that show to be a guest, to be serious. I think she went on because it was something that she could do, and it was something that she could put on her resume. And she was Montel Williams' friend. Because yes. I believe if it was more of a serious time, it would have been not so much of just, oh, this is what I see. It would have been very serious and very professional. Yeah. And she's like you said, she's not going to give her services away for absolutely positively nothing to these people. Correct. And I if she paid have, attention I, more on the show, I think the show was for a show. It was for TV to watch it. Ratings were good, and that's what, you know? And it got more people to come to her shop in, in California and do the real yeah. stuff. I agree with you. Now, was and, she at her shop, or is this one of these things like the Long no, Island she, psychic where they're not there sometimes? Oh no, no, she had a she had a she whole had a, thing. She started a whole. Uh, she actually started a religion, even though it's Christian based. But she started a religion that had to do with the psychic stuff. But she had like people there who practitioners there. She had other psychics there too. In fact, yeah. I think it's still there. It's in San Jose, California. I would but, love to open up a. Yeah. Uh, uh, a psychic network Me if too. i could figure out how to do it but a lot of times these psychic networks do it for profits and don't you know don't yeah. care about the people on the other end of the phone now for the long island medium you ever met her i have not met her i i find her interesting but i really like you know who i like better R renee russo i like renee russo quite who's a lot. that she's a psychic medium who has a tv show okay uh, she's also from new york uh, I think she also lives on Long Island, but she's not the Long Island medium. She's a, a psychic medium. She's more like what I do. Uh, and she's got uh, LT, uh, in, what is the name of those initials for that TV show? Uh, LTC or Latino, I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, I don't. I forget too. Uh, it'll come up. But her name's Renee Russo, and I really like her. I'd like to meet her. She, uh, unfortunately, there's some I don't like. The Long Island medium's okay. She's kind of cool, but you know, I think. She's not, she, she talks about it. She's only a medium. She's not a psychic. She's just a medium. So what, tell, what's, what's the difference? I thought she was a psychic. I thought she no, was somebody that. No, she'll uh, tell you she's not a psychic. Means that she does not do readings unless she's talking to dead people, meaning she doesn't have any gift of her own that she uses. Okay. She, she doesn't pick up, she can't sit there and say, wait, let's have a talk right now. And she says, this is your past, this is your present future. She won't tell you that. She'll sit down with you and say, Wade, so-and-so is talking to you, and she'll tell you what they say. She never tells you your own reading. She just tells it to the dead people that talk to her. That's a medium. So she's, she's like a, a mystic. She's a medium. She'll tell you, I'm a medium, nothing else. Yeah, but I'm they used to call them mystics, where they just talk to the dead, the they talk to the lot. other side. Well, we do a lot of things, because I am a mystic, but I do a lot of things, so... I, I talk to you the side. I'm a psychic. I'm a psychic medium. So it's a matter of what your things are. If you're a clairvoyant, clairaudient, clair, you know, uh, all the clairs, that's basically your psychic gift. She's just clairvoyant. Talks to only dead people. So, and then Renee Russo is like me, psychic medium, a mystic in that sense. And then there's that kid who I think is also just a medium. And he's a, a, he's a boy. He's a young, well, he's probably an adult, young adult, but he, he has a TV show, too. He's from California, and you can tell. And he doesn't know who anybody is, um, just to be honest. He, he meets these very famous people at their Beverly Hills thing. 
he's like a millionaire, but he picks up stuff from their family members and stuff. Um, I look one day we'll have a talk about all these TV shows they do and tell you which ones are more real to me than the ones that are not. Well, and, you got to remember, um, like I've always said about TV shows, they're yeah. not going to do something where they're going to get a one for rating. They're going to up that thing to yes, just like the paranormal shows. Um, yes, I saw one. I was with them. They made a big deal about a noise in the hallway. They made the noise a little bit bigger. They rehearsed it going down the hallway. It's all for show. People don't realize yeah. that for the 45 minutes you're watching on TV, they might have been there for four days. Oh, they were. Yeah, I watched um, those shows too. Yeah, you know, Justin the Jackson. psychic, I, I know the Long Island medium will spend a day or, or, you know, they rehearsed with the people. She's already talked to them once and then they'll go again and do something. Yes. Um, I know would, with Sylvia Brown's show, that it was yeah. all rehearsed. It was literally scripted. The well, Montel Williams show was a lot of it scripted. I'm Donahue Montel. was a lot of scripted. Well, I went to the Montel Williams show. I was on it. Uh, I wasn't on it as a psychic. I was on it just uh, for uh, an episode that had nothing to do with Sylvia Brown. It was an episode about tax, you know, tax evasion and stuff like that, but um, protecting your identity. And it was done very quickly. Yes, they had a certain order. They did things. You're correct. Now, and I, 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 and if I'm not mistaken, I don't know. Donahue didn't do it, but I know Jerry Springer did it. He would have four episodes taped at one time. Well, I knew people who was on Jerry uh, on his show. I know people who were hired to be on the show. A lot of them were actors, as you know. Well, but he got the, the real stuff from real stories he read about. He did. He did, and that's what they did. But I knew. I knew a comedian. Yeah. I knew a comedian that was him and his girl. His him and his friend were on the uh, Jerry Jerry show, but they were there to pretend that they were high school sweethearts who rehooked up, and they weren't. But that was just part of the. But it yeah. was based on something that they read about. Well, yeah. again, it was a, it was a show to get people to watch. It was like professional yeah. wrestling. I want and you to watch it. So today we're going to have a cage match. Um, right. I want you to watch it. So we're going to hit a few people in the head with chairs, and we're going to have the audience throw chairs into the ring. So and next it's, week it's you tune people. in, but next week we're not going to have anything but regular matches. You know what I mean? Right. And that's why I think he he like you said, Sylvia went on yeah. the show as a friend because he was helping her get yeah. more people to go to her shop. In her her place, her place. But they helped place. each other. She made money from people, and he got ratings. Exactly, and that's what they do. Who and was the other money. one? Geraldo or something? He used to. Yeah, he did that. Geraldo. And what was the other one? Uh, Ricky Lake. Was, she would have a few. Who did it? Jenny Jones for a while had a show. No, I met ones that were like scripted. I think. Um, well, I think they were. Ricky uh, Lake they were. was. I was told Maury Povich is scripted that the people are oh, not yeah. the 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 people that are saying you're your fa the father and this and that. Yeah. I was told they're actors and the real people that had the test are you know we'll find out the answers, but they're acting it out. I don't know how true it is or not. I, I would yeah, think I, it would be a heck of a lot of money sending these people plane tickets all over the U.S. I, and hotel they, rooms. They, the, the person I knew that went on the uh, Jerry show, uh, the comedian, he didn't live that far away. They hired local actors. They even yeah. he put one put me on the list so I could go on the show because I'm an actor, right? So I have not been asked to be on that show, but I went on a show years ago. I went on, uh, but I was only audience member for Montel Williams. But the other one I went on as a guest, and I was a guest on one of those shows. It was a really long time ago. Uh, we're talking a good almost 30 years ago. It was a... Um, Oh, what was his name? God, he did. He was almost like uh, doing the Morton Downey Jr., but he was a little. Oh, uh, Sinel Hall. No, no, he was out of New Jersey. He was. He's not famous. He's not an actor of. Any Morton sort. Downey Jr. There you go. No, that guy no, was I pretty cool. I want to show like his. I want to show no, like I his. Morton Downey Jr. And he's, by the way, Mer Morton Downey Jr. was a very nice man, but his show was just all acting. But, well, uh, it it also had the topics that nobody else wanted. Well, it did because he did him, but there was another guy who was a, a, a better-looking guy in general. Donahue? In New Jersey. His name was either Gary something, and he had a show like that. Uh, oh, God. He had, his name had the same initials. It was like he was like Ben, Ben, you know, Benny or something like that. And he was, um, he was quite, he was trying to be Morton Downey Jr., but he wasn't as good at it. And so he was always con he tried to make controversy. He was There's only one Martin Downey Jr. There's only one no, Jerry Springer. 
I know who Morton Downey Jr. is, though. This guy had a TV show. Trust me. It's it's all over. I was on it because I have a videotape of it somewhere. But he had a show in New Jersey. He was very local, very local. He didn't make it that big. He never got famous enough because he came after Morton Downey and he wasn't as good. So, um, and his, I want to say his name was, I looked him up the other day and I forgot his name, but it'll come to me and I'll send it to you. And you'll see that he had some videos out there. But I did a, I didn't, his show was totally scripted. Nothing on his show was real. He basically got the people that Morton Downey Jr. show didn't take. See, Martin Downey Jr. was a mix of stuff, but he did stuff, for for the people listening, Morton Downey Jr. did stuff that topics like rock music or, you know, the uh, well, know Ku Klux Klan or, I, I, you I know. I actually played baseball with Morton Downey Jr. because uh, uh, I worked at the agency that represented him. But at the time that his show was out, they didn't have shows about that stuff. You didn't, well, you didn't do person. that stuff. I know, but somebody copied it because once it works, you know they do it again. Yeah. So, well, uh, I'm one. I knew one of the people who copied him because I was on that show. But Morton Downey Jr., who, who by the way his name was really Sean. Uh, I just found that out. But I, I was. Uh, I knew him because he went through the, uh, the same program. And wasn't he a singer? He was a, a singer and actor. I think early on in his life, yes, he was older. And his than dad he was. was too, wasn't he? Uh, I don't, I think his dad was a singer. Yes, I think his dad was a very, a, a rather popular singer. A country singer. singer. They have two country hits, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if he was a country singer, but, uh, Martin Eugenio uh, Sr. did something really famous. Yeah. I think it was more like, uh, he sang something else. Morton Downey himself. And I hate to say was. this, that he had daddy's money and he became famous on it. Well, he did. His, his father, Sean, his father was Sean, uh, Morton J Downey. Uh, and he was a greatest success in the late 1900s. He was called the Irish Nightingale. He was an Irish singer, his father, yeah. uh, Martin Downey's father. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Morton Downey, by the way, was a pretty nice guy. Uh, yeah, his father sang Irish songs. It's all Irish. My mother probably listened to him because he has When Irish Eyes Are Smiling, Where the River Shannon Flows. Yeah. He was an Irish singer, so he yeah. wasn't a country at all, just Irish. That country. I and I think it. Martin Downey Jr. was a lounge singer. A lot of it was like in he front of people eating singer. and stuff. You're correct. He was but, a lounge but singer. But like I said, the show, for those of you who don't know what the show was, yes. he would have two people uh, that were on one side, two people on the other, and he would have an argument on why both sides are right. And some of the shows were, you know, like Terrorist, uh, uh, Hell's Angels, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, the, uh, yeah. what was that other guy? Um, he he, had he wanted sleep. Islamic uh, religion all over New York City. He was a famous yes, ru uh, yeah. a leader of the Islamic community. But at that time, people, you didn't do that. You had something simple like this girl cheated or this lady right here has an eating disorder or, or something really, really good for the family to watch. You didn't watch Morton Downey Jr. with your family. Or if you did, it was you and your wife or whatever, you and your husband or you and mom and dad, and that was it. The kids did not, they went and watched cartoons in another room. He would smoke. He would uh, yell and scream at his guest. He would tell them to shut up or zip it when he didn't want them to speak. And it was a new kind of show. And he yelled at them. There's a guy who does that now. Yeah. He yelled at them. Yeah. Oh, I, for, I forgot what his, that guy's name is. Uh, he used to be a um, yeah, the guy guard for like, Jerry Springer. Yeah, yeah, and he, he was he's a bald guy, and I forget yeah. his name. You're right, I see him. But too. a lot of these people have the era of the talk show like that is kind of dying because people don't, you know, it's, I don't know, it's it's something different. If you're not pregnant and you don't know who the father of the kid is, which would make you a slut or something. If you uh, uh, abused your family and abused your husband or something, that's the newest stuff they want to hear about. They don't want to hear about, you know, some guy smoking and yelling at you, which I would love to have a show like that where I stood up at the podium. He stood at a podium. He didn't walk around with a microphone. He made his guests sit right in front of him, and if they disobeyed him, he'd get up and tell them to walk off and... And, 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 you know, and, and you've been around for a very long time, just like I have in showbiz. You didn't tell your guests to get the hell off the stage and go away, or they would give you a bad rating. Right, right. He's, he's called he trash, would. He's called Trash TV, the beginning of Trash TV. 
It was just well, I don't TV. know if it's trash TV, but uh, like one episode, the guy told him that he was wrong. He goes, no, you're wrong. And he just took him by the elbow and said, get off my stage. Get out of here. And everybody cheered that he left. Well, if you told your guests to leave, you, you, would, you wouldn't get any ratings. He got ratings for doing it. Yeah. Well, he did at that time because he was one of the first to do that kind of yeah. stuff. They called it Trash TV, by the way. That oh, that, that's what they called it? Yeah, because he had trashy people on there. He had people who were very controversial and trashy and stuff like that. And and if I'm not mistaken, his show was not at uh, eight o'clock in the morning like Donahue was. No, no, no. That was like an eleven o'clock or you know mid uh, nine o'clock at night kind of deal, right after the news, like uh, uh, the David Letterman show. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Martin Downey Jr. would be in the classification of Jay Leno, David Letterman. And uh, what's his name now up there? Uh, Conan O'Brien and all those guys. But while well, those guys are retired, actually. But that was the kind of show he did at late night, you know, television. So let's let's now go into your acting career. You were you are an actress. Yes. Uh, let's briefly talk about that. What what transpired with that? How did that get started? Well, that got started definitely as a kid because I think I was watching the Lassie TV show when I was about two or three years old and I wanted to be uh, I found out who the guy was by the way who had a talk show that was similar to him his uh, name was Richard Bay by the way Richard Bay show okay. look up the Richard Bay show and the other guy is Steve Wilcox he did talk about Steve Wilcox yes that's, that's, that's the yeah, yeah well, Steve Wilcox uh, uh, specializes in people that can't take care of their girlfriends or yeah. You know, you let grandma, you know, go while you went on vacation. She sat home and, 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 and sat in her own waist and didn't go to the bathroom right. Oh, so what I'll do, so I was on the Richard Bay show, but as my acting career, because that was part of my acting yeah. career, I was hired to be on that show. But uh, what happened was I was a kid and I told my mother I wanted to be on the, I wanted to be the little girl that Lassie saved and also that Elvis Presley sang to of course, neither one of those ever happened as a child, but my mother did put me in some theater in Arizona where I'm from. So my mother being a singer herself, my mother was an opera singer, and she also sang musicals because that's her era and everything. So she would she took me, when I was about seven or eight, she took me to auditions uh, for a couple of uh, musicals. She did Carousel and The Sound of Music, and uh, I chickened out the audition for Carousel because I probably would have been in it. But what happened was I went to Sound of Music and I became like the understudy for one of the little girls, you know, a Marta, because I was only seven years old, seven or eight years old. And so I started, uh, the guy who did the show, the Sound of Music, at Jewish Community Center, I started kind of hanging out there and taking yeah. classes and doing, uh, he did original shows for children. Uh -huh. and stuff. So I did children's theater. That's how it started. And then I just kept in love with it. I've always loved acting and performing. And I tap dance. You know, all the stuff they did. My mother had me in tap dancing lessons. I got to be on TV when I was eight, uh, locally in Arizona on a children's, because our, our tap group won a contest that we got to dance on the big giant stage at, at ASU. People who know, you know, Arizona State University, they have a stage called uh, the Gamage Center, and uh -huh. it's very famous. And we got our group, 10 groups from like 100 of us auditioned at a big thing, and we all, 10 of us got to be. Uh, perform on the stage at Grady Damage. Again, I was like 11 years old by that time, so I got to dance on stage a couple times. And I just in love with the spotlight like that, and I've always done it. Now, this year, that catching up, I'm a member of Actors' Equity, which is the stage union. Uh, I've done mostly stage work. I've done some TV and film, uh, mostly on a very small scale. Uh, like I said, stuff like Richard Bay Show or whatever some commercial work that was a, really a commercial and then uh it was actually remember those commercials they show late at night the tele commercials that last for like 20 minutes that's what i did i think it's i like know a, what they are they they had a name for it it was in the 90s very popular but i did one of those they were uh things. telemarketing uh telemarketing uh, tele um, yeah. a shoppers network or what was that Stuff one like that. called uh, and this one was for an acne medication for adults and I have such clear skin. They loved my skin. So they asked me to do this commercial. They did really give us the product, but Richard Bay was the host or whatever. So I ended up doing that. Uh, that was in the 90s, early 90s. Um, aside from that's my biggest thing. And I've been in a couple of movies. If you watch the movie 
which uh, when I was in California, I did a lot of background work. So I ended up getting a featured background work in the movie Man on the Moon or Man in the Moon about Andy Kaufman with, uh, you know, so. I yes, who was a, who was a, who they say is still alive, but I don't know how yes, old he would yeah, be. Yeah, Jim Carrey, you know, was in the film and uh, Milos Foreman was the director, a very famous director. Courtney Love was in the film. So I worked a, a big day on that, a, basically a 14 hour day. And it was the scene. If you watch the movie, because I'm going to tell you, you can see me in a film. Uh, if you watch the movie uh, Man in the Moon and there's a scene, if you have the DVD, it helps, where he's beating up women on the Merv Griffin show. Speaking of talk shows, because that's a good segue there. Merv Griffin was a, a talk show back in the day. and uh, Who Andy also Hoffman, made uh, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy. Yes. Uh, very, uh, very uh, who's Jeopardy. the other one he made? Uh, the The thousand yeah. dollar pyramid and the square one where they all you, you gotta guess hollywood who did squares. it right hollywood squares yes he's a very famous man was but anyways they had an actor playing him because uh andy kaufman the real andy kaufman ended up on his tv show and on that particular episode back in the 70s it takes place in the 70s um andy kaufman was threatening to beat up women and he beat up a woman from the audience who ended up beating becoming his wife in real life but in the reenactment of that scene, I'm one of the uh, extras in it, but I got two huge close-ups because Jim Carrey is a very method actor, as I was trained in and do. And so during one of the breaks, we were supposed to be all these women. It was all women, pretty much. And so when we're going off on break, uh, Milo's foreman asked us to help keep Jim Carrey in character. And just whatever he does, just go along with it because Jim would make us call him Andy instead of Jim Carrey because he was in character. So as we were leaving the set and we were, like I said, there for 14, 16 hours, we had some breaks. So as we're leaving the set, we're going by uh, Andy Kaufman, not, you know, Jim Carrey. And he's yelling at us saying, I'm going to beat you up and I'm going to beat you up. And no, everybody's kind of ignoring him because these are just people who do extra work for extra money. They're not really actors. So I was one of the ones who was really an actor. And as I passed Jim Carrey, he goes, I'm going to beat you up. I said, you and what army? And I started uh, improv with him. And as I improv with him, he started improv back with me. So him and I had this major argument in character, obviously. And we had a whole verbal thing. Somebody was filming it. It didn't end up on the outtakes, unfortunately. I wish it had. But anyways, we were doing this whole thing. And Jim Carrey and I improvised this whole uh improvisational argument between the two of us and then they thanked me and Migos Foreman later so he gave me two huge close-ups in the film I didn't know it till the movie was released they never told me because I got paid really well but I didn't get I should have got my SAG voucher for it but I didn't get a Screen Actors Guild voucher people who know acting will understand that but I went when I, I have no movie. idea what that is so you're okay, gonna have to explain what that is for, for film actors is Screen Actors Guild and in order to be in a Screen Actors Guild film, which is anything that's made that's got a major budget, like, like a Jim Carrey film, any kind of film like that, for the most part, there's different levels of budget. In order to be in one of those films as a character, a lead character, or at least a speaking role, you generally, if it's a big budget, you have to be a member of the Screen Actors Guild, which means you pay your dues because it's a union. And... Um, the only way to become a member of the And we all know what I think of unions. I know. But that is what show business is if you're going to be in show business. So Screen Actors Guild, if you're not a member, you cannot be in a Screen Actors Guild film, uh, legally speaking, after a certain point. So you have to have three vouchers to become a member, and you got to pay your dues. Uh, you can also get what they call a taft Hartley, which means you get a lead role, and they automatically let you join so so how do you get a voucher is this like a piece a of paper if you get moved up into like a five or under you know an under five uh -huh. an under five means you know less than five lines yeah so sometimes you can get a featured extra which is basically what happened to me i didn't have any lines uh -huh. but i was featured in the film and sometimes if you've got a really nice assistant director they'll give you a voucher you get paid a little more SAG vouchers are good because if you're a SAG member or have a SAG voucher... Now, what is that? Now, what, what, okay. is, what is... Well, 
because if you're an extra in a film, a, a uh, major motion picture, this my a big budget, okay? Because uh, there's different budgets. But if you're in a big giant film like a Jim Carrey film, yeah, as an extra at that time, yeah, this was quite a few years ago. Uh, you get paid about to be around all day for 15 hours, but for eight hours you get paid about 91 dollars at the time. For no matter how hard you work, you get ninety one dollars. That's it, and then you get some overtime if you uh, work past eight hours. Okay, and th then there's some rules, the union rules. Now, if you're a SAG extra and they have to hire, now what it, extra, what is SAG? What is that's the Screen Actors Guild. Screen Actors, actors Guild. Guild. A CAG. It's SAG. S A G, like you're sagging, like your your breasts sag when you get older. Uh huh. Yeah. Screen Actors Guild. It's screen, okay. you know, like a uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so Screen Actors Guild, if you're a member of that, uh -huh. well, you get paid more like at that time, you would get paid about $115 for eight hours a day as an extra. So as how do you extra. join these two things? Well, it's a catch-22. Now, the only way to become a member of SAG is two ways, basically. Uh -huh. You can get three SAG vouchers as an extra, and that's just a matter of the assistant director deciding to give you one. So if they have a, a law, the rule of the SAG, of the Screen Actors Guild in California, at least, and maybe in New York, they have to, the first 10, depending on how many extras they need for a film, let's say the film needs a thousand extras. Uh -huh. For their budget, they have to hire like a hundred SAG members. Okay. First. So they'll call up people who just do extra work that are a member of SAG that pay their dues and say, I need you to come be an extra in this movie. Uh, you're in my top 100. You're number 83. Okay. And okay. this is just the big background work. After they, they call 100 people for 1,000 a, a extras, because this movie was that big. So as an extra, we're talking about, you know, like in a medieval movie, since we're talking about yeah. medieval stuff. Yeah. You would just be the guys running around on the horses, sword fighting while the actors are sitting there saying their stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're just the background. You're whatever. Okay. You're sitting in a bar. You're, you're, you're a nobody, and, you know, just, nobody. just for fodder. Your scenery is what you are. Your scenery. Yeah, you are moving yeah. scenery. You're living scenery. Okay. So, they have to hire in a if they have if they need a thousand extras for a medieval scene because that would be a thousand extras. Uh -huh. They need a thousand extras in Rob Roy, okay? Uh -huh. So they would first hire as a SAG rule. They have to hire a first hundred have to be at, at least the first hundred, maybe more. But the first hundred have to be SAG members. So they will call up anybody they know who does a lot of extra work, and that's all they do. They don't want to do anything else. So they'll call up these SAG extras and say, "Hey." Can you come be a SAG extra tomorrow at, you know, six in the morning until whenever? And they'll go yes or no. And then they will be booked. Now, they don't have to necessarily confirm, but they're booked. So let's say the next day you show up at 6 a.m. and the assistant director who handles, who checks in, has to check in the SAG extras. And then everybody else, the rest of the thousand, you have 100 SAG extras and the rest can be non-union because you paid them less and it's less on the budget. So a lot of the movies do that. They'll hire, and they treat you less than human. The SAG extras, you got to treat a little better. But let's say you don't have to feed them the same food. Like the SAGs, SAG extras have to get fed with the, the real movie stars because they have to have good food. But they can give us a box lunch if we're non-union. And they can pay us less. And they can abuse us a little more. We don't have to wait in the same area. Like they may have to put the SAG extras indoors and we could wait outside. So, so other than getting a voucher from some guy that just picks and chooses who he thinks looks the beautiful enough, well, how is the other way to do it? Well, how do you tell how you get the voucher? Because now, if you have a hundred extras that already said yes, they're already members of SAG, so there are no vouchers. But he has a hundred vouchers available for those hundred people. Uh -huh. Now, let's say a couple of those people don't show up because they yeah. sometimes just don't show up. Then he can give those SAG vouchers. For more money, you'll get paid more. He can give them to any non-union person, like you said, that's beautiful or whatever he likes. If he wants to sleep with her, he may give it to some sexy girl just so she gets paid a little more and she gets her voucher. And once you get three of those vouchers and you talk to assistant director because there's people who just don't show up, you get paid as because you have to have the 100 SAG vouchers given out. You have to. There's no other way around it. So if somebody doesn't show up that's a SAG member, you can give it to anybody you want if you're the assistant director. So he'll give it to the sexiest So what you're ever. saying is the assistant director is the boss, not the director. Yeah, the assistant director is the boss of the extras, not of anything else, oh. just the extras. 
So uh, he, so the assistant director will be AD. He will give the vouchers to whoever. And, of course, everybody tries to get the voucher because it, they know when you get three, you can join the union and get paid more every time. So you get a lot of people who just want it for that reason. And that's what they want it for. And you get better meals and et cetera. The other way to get a SAG, to join SAG, and it's the only other way, you got to know somebody or you get a lead in a movie because you're so good and they just can't find anybody else who can do it as well as you. You get a, a lead or a, a co-star, maybe not a lead. Let's say your first film, if you get hired through an audition through your agent and you get a part like, I'm trying to think, well, Robin Hood's like Little John, okay? You get to play Little John, okay? Uh, and Little John is not the biggest role in this film. It just happens to be Little John's in there, and he has about 10 lines. He might be in a couple scenes. And they find, they like you the best. It's Wade is the only one that can play this role because he looks the right way. We like the way he looks with the star. So we're going to hire Wade to do audition. We're going to hire Wade to play Little John. So they're going to give you a Taft Hartley. And a Taft-Hartley is that they basically say, here's your Taft-Hartley, which means you're working as a member of SAG for that whole film. And you get paid as a person at the highest level of a co-star, because you're playing a co-star, because you have more than eight lines, or more than five. And you're going to get paid at the highest level for that Taft-Hartley contract. That's your contract. Now, the Taft-Hartley gives you full rights to join the union when you have your dues, because it costs money to join. So you can, you will, your dues will be paid for that movie. And now you are a member of, automatically, of SAG because they paid your dues as part of your, you know, being in the film. Now, when you go to do another film, let's say after you finish that film and they shoot, because I'm going to... Now, we're not talking about independent films. We're talking about good films. Independent films, uh, we're talking about major motion. Yeah, Yeah. Because that's because you can do an independent film that is not. Because I have a friend that might be a guest on the show who made his two movies: a horror, a comedy horror movie, and a kind of an adult comedy horror movie type. You'd have to you know. ask if it had a SAG contract, but it may not have because it's independent. But I did an independent film that was on a low budget SAG. This uh, in uh, I'm going to tell you in a second, August and September, and it was a SAG movie. But I did not get my SAG voucher, nor did I get a SAG card because there are different contracts. This was a low-budget, they call it a low-budget uh, SAG film. Now, is there benefits of not being in this union? Yes. A lot of the benefits are you can work more often because, uh-huh. again, they have, they have a limit. They don't like to pay the most price because you're more likely to get extra work as a non-union because yeah. there's going to be more chances uh, if you want to work as an extra. Yeah. Uh, because they just they like the cheaper. The cheaper you are, the better. And if the movie is being made, like you said, an independent, and they don't have a SAG contract to meet, you can work a lot more in independent films. So it is an advantage not now, to Now, as a SAG that. worker, you can't do anything that's not union, right? Correct. That's where yeah. you run into a problem. That's what I was going to yeah. say. If you did the movie Robin Hood and you became a member of SAG and uh-huh. your dues are paid, you can't do anything independent anymore. You have to do only SAG signatory roles. Yeah. That's it. Or yeah. you don't work. Because that... otherwise you're breaking the rules. And they'll kick you out. That's crazy. Yeah, and they do that with uh, Actors' Equity, which I'm also a me- member of. Technically speaking, I'm what, what they call frozen, which means uh, I haven't paid my dues, but I'm on hold. Uh, as a member of that, that means I can't do any theater that is not uh, Actors' Equity, but I, I'm not really Actors' Equity because I, I don't haven't paid my dues, so I'm kind of caught in between a rock and a hard place and if they don't pay enough to pay my dues because I owe them like $600 just to catch up, uh-huh. if I got a part in a, a Broadway show, because that's, of course, they pay very well. But if I got a part in a Broadway show, uh-huh. I would have to pay my dues, the uh-huh. $600. And then they do pay, uh, by the way, a Broadway show pays about 2000 a week. So I would make enough money in the first week to pay it. But then I would be a member. But I can't do an off-Broadway show, way off-Broadway. Uh, because it would probably be non-union, and even if it's paying work, I can't generally do any theater that is not, you know, I'm non-union uh, Screen Actors Guild, though. I'm not a Screen Actors Guild member. Now, in September and October, I did get a role in a film that's also kind of a spoofy horror film called uh-huh. Rock and Roll versus the Invisible Bees. And it should be on Amazon Prime, I think, coming up in a few months. I don't know. Uh-huh. It's 
we filmed it in September, August in Pennsylvania, and they took me on location. It was a low budget SAG film. I, I basically, uh, I played a role. I was a co-star. So I got a hundred dollars a day when I worked and the people who were, because it's low budget, the SAG people got 150 bucks a day, uh, for eight hours. And uh, they treated us really well. Actually, it was one of the best shoots I've ever been in. And you're treated better as a co-star and that on a set than you are as an extra. I was not an extra. Uh, and on that kind of film, the extras were also, you don't have, you don't have to have SAG extras. We only had non-union extras for one day and they didn't get paid anything. So they just get to be in the film, but there wasn't that many of them either. But that's because it's a little I have a friend that was accidentally in Libestrum, if you've ever heard of that film. No, but you know what film I was in and I didn't know I was in until I saw it also on the screen? American Pie, the very oh, really? famous, you know, the original one. It had a different title when I did extra work on it. Now, if you blink, you will miss me. I am in the film, but if you blink, you miss me. Yeah. If you watch uh, Man in the Moon, you will see me quite clearly. And I, they have two huge close-ups during the beating scene. And then in American Pie, there's a uh-huh. scene where they're at the choir. And if they, they, they pan the audience really quick at the choir concert. Uh-huh. And I'm right dead center of camera. But if you blink, you will miss me. Yeah. And... I was one of the only humans there because they had a bunch of cardboard cut- cutouts, heads of people, just to look like there was more people there. That was like a faker. Well, well Libestrum was filmed in our area. Um, oh, okay, cool. Uh, and uh, it was filmed downtown, in fact. And oh. my friend was walking down the street to go to an appointment or at lunch or whatever he was doing there. He, he sometimes would have told us it was an appointment. Other times he was going to lunch. Um. So he's walking, and he's totally oblivious that they're filming. He doesn't care, you know, that they're filming. Okay, so he's walking in the background, and they said action. And because when he got to the end of the sidewalk, the guy's like, hey, you got to go back over there. So he's like, oh, okay. So he sat down, got up, and, you know, walked away like uh, whatever, dude, you know. But yeah. I guess he's in it walking in the background. Oh, is So yeah. that, was, that was a little accident, but he's in it. I'm on some TV shows like that, but I never watched them all. Some of the background I did, uh, and I did most of it in California when I lived there. Yeah. All the background work I did, I never always watched the, the TV shows I did. So I was on TV shows that may actually have big, huge close-ups of me, and I don't even know because I never watched now, them. Now, do they owe you money for that? Because that's, no, you know, they always you're... paid me. They always paid me because I, did, I did it through Central Casting. So Central oh. Casting always pays you. But I'll tell you what. Uh, What's Central I mean, Casting? What What is... That's an extra agency right here in Manhattan. You can go there and sign up and do extra work, and they'll call you all the uh, – well, depending on who you are, but they need men more than women usually. And if they're back to shooting, which they are – Now, do you get to meet these actors? Like Jim, Tim oh, Carrey, yeah. did you go – Jim Carrey, did you go up to him and take a picture well, with him and meet him? came up to me. Jim Carrey kind of got, grabbed me. But uh, you're not supposed to approach them unless they approach you. That's no. number one rule as an extra. But sometimes you're doing scenes with them. Like I did some TV shows, and I worked with, I worked with Christopher Walken, and Christopher Walken kept telling me jokes, and you can't see me. And uh, that was in the movie Joe Dirt. Remember Joe Dirt with? Uh, no. Okay, I was in that one, but you can't really see me in that one. Um, and Joe Dirt, Christopher Walken, I did a scene with him, and he was like talking to me the whole time because I was the only one that was an adult. Uh, it was a scene in a junior high school, so I was playing a teacher. And so Christopher Walken liked to tell me jokes. I, uh, they weren't, I didn't understand them, but, but he was very funny because I thought he was trying to make me laugh. And he did make me laugh because it was just funny because the, the jokes didn't make any sense. Um, Have you I, ever met any actors or actresses you didn't like? Like you would say, don't like, ever, they're crazy? Okay, well, one who's very snobby. I think mostly snobby, too. I did a movie with... Uh, uh, now, Harry Connick Jr., very nice guy. He was I great. But he did a movie with uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. Uh-huh. He's not very nice. Very snobby. Now, and are they snobby because they've earned it, or are they just snobby because they're snobs? They're snobby because they're snobs. They think they're better than everybody, and uh-huh. they're really just human beings, because I don't care. And then um, Sarah Jessica Parker was not very nice. Uh, she was the snobby. And Craig Ferguson, who I love, uh-huh. He was he was too busy trying to get one of the extras to go to bed with him when we were doing the film. So he didn't he wasn't he wasn't 
unnice, but he wasn't very nice either. I, that's all yeah, I can say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was too busy, uh, like you know, sweating over this girl who hated him. She couldn't stand. Because him. I've I've been that way with professional wrestlers. I I did yeah. um, a little bit of stuff, um, and I've met some professional wrestlers that set up or something, and yeah. some of them can be very nice. Others are like, you know, why are you in a people field? You're 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 wrestling exactly. in front of children. The whole role of you know. The whole five, four rolls back are nothing but kids with signs, and you're acting like that. Yes, I agree with you. Some of them and there's no kind of... reason for this. It's not like he's low paid. Uh, yeah. it, it, he just did it. Right. And I've and seen I some think... of them out back yeah. uh, doing autographs that, what if you don't want to give an autograph, don't walk over to the people. I agree. Yeah, because you know what? I, I do think it's unnecessary. They're just human beings that, had a lucky break and, or and I've seen others uh, I'll, I'll say this one's name C.W. Anderson he was an ECW wrestler as well as others yeah. he uh, didn't come off very nice however uh, during the intermission and break he went and got some food he came back I uh, talked to him about the Anderson name he was very openly and talked to me Yeah. I kind of thought he was going to shove me off he didn't he was totally the opposite yeah I guess Rhino is totally the opposite. He's, uh, you know, his character is just tough, you know, well, but he's not. People, the people who knew back in the day Morton Downey Jr. thought he was mean, but in real life he was very nice. He didn't yell at people. He was a very nice guy. He was just... He well, was he was kid. also the type of guy that once he was d done, he's done. He's not doing it exactly. for TV anymore. And yeah. I honestly think he did it to be a macho on TV. He did. He, he was he was such a... I saw him at the agency. I worked at the agency that represented him. Uh, and I'll tell you, the nicest people... The agency I worked for, we represented people mostly for college tours. It wasn't like movie uh -huh. stars. It was, and the nicest people were Dr. Joyce Brothers, sweetest lady I ever met, always remembered your name. What was she like? She was just so sweet. That's she that sexual doctor, right? No, no, the sexual one, we had her too. That's the height. The Catherine Height. She's snobby. I don't like her. Oh. I don't like Height. Height is not. Uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers every now and again talks about sex, but not as often. Dr. Joyce Brothers passed away, but the other one, Kat, the one you're talking about, Height. Her last name is Height. Uh, Catherine Height or something like that. She's not very nice. She's yeah. very into. She's very snobby because she's very pretty and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, the other person who was very such a mean son of a bitch all the time, but he was drunk. Abby Hoffman of the Chicago Seven, just the son of a. Bitch. I don't know who he is. Yeah, he's long dead now. Uh, and Hunter S. Thompson was okay. The one I wanted to meet was Larry King. I'd love to meet Don Imus, even to though I was him. told I wouldn't want to. You know who was very nice? Spanky McFarland. I don't know if you remember who that is. I from don't. The Little Rascals. He was a really nice guy. Uh, Graham Chapman of Monty Python. Very yeah. sweet. Very sweet. Uh, funny. Funny um, as hell. Warwick Davis I would like to meet. Which one? Warwick Davis. Oh, I like Warwick Davis. Yeah, he'd be nice. Although he's I was not... told he's not the talkative type, and... He might just be quiet. He's yeah. just like Worf on Star Trek. I, I wouldn't mind. But oh. I was told Worf and Data, too, if you don't talk Star Trek, they're fine with it. They're whatever. Oh, probably. Yeah, they probably are. Now, William Shatner, I heard, can be not... I heard he can be temperamental, too. I not the, the fun guy, like, uh, don't talk no. to me about Star Trek. I did it, so what? You I know don't know. I've never met him. I've never been to these conventions. And the uh, no. uh, Riker, I... the guy that played uh, Captain Picard's second uh, XO, I was told sometimes can be... I don't... You know, want to talk Star Trek. I, I, I did a couple of conventions because of the Rocky Horror tied into yeah. a couple of ones I went to. Yeah. But uh, I didn't. I never met those. I never met them. Uh, I've heard rumor though what you said that the, I know Trekkies. I heard that William Shatner can be a bit snobby. Uh, I, I and I was told there's no reason for him to be that way. No, it's not like no Trekkies reason. are being mean to him. They just want to know what it was like doing it. They're thankful yeah. to have him, and he'll what just walk him? away from them. Just totally walk away. Watching guy now. You know who was? You know who I worked with that was very nice. I worked with Leonard Nimoy's son. He was a director of an episode of uh, the uh, lawyer show I was yeah. in for three days. And Leonard Nimoy's son was, well, Leonard Nimoy's son was just kind of depressed. He was just depressed. Leonard Nimoy was very nice. Yes, he was. That's what I heard. His son was nice, 
but his son was directing. Uh, I was in. I worked three days on uh, the uh, Ali McBeal show, and the uh, Ali McBeal show. Uh, Litter Nimoy's son was the director of that episode that I was in. And he was he was nice, but he he seemed very he was very stressed. Let's call it stressed. He didn't yell at us or anything. Yeah. He just was he just seemed kind of depressed, and uh, he was nice enough. But uh, the yeah, I think the meanest people I know. Milos Forman was very nice. He was a very nice director. He passed away not terribly long ago. I'm Jim at, Carrey was Jim Carrey was hilarious. He I was met just, one of the the guys that did the a Bigfoot show on TV, and he was not. Uh, let's just say for being in the people industry, he was not a people person. Yeah, some of them, you know, I... I forgot what his name was, but his show was on sci-fi, and I asked him, I go, what it's like having cameras around? Yeah. So there's one lady sitting there. He goes, I don't know, what, what do you mean cameras? I said, what's it like to have a camera around? You know, what's it's different to have it. I've, I've done it. I've, you know, paranormal investigator, I... Was wondering what it's like for him to do it. All you know, he yeah. goes, "I don't know what I don't know what what's going on." And he got up and walked away. Well, I had an almost a thirty-minute conversation with the camera crew. The camera crew was much nicer. Oh yeah, all the crew. I got the nice. I got to hear some stories of them going through the woods and seeing things and hearing things and you know wondering why the people are not responding to the stuff. Yeah, I guess I mean, she was. Couple people who weren't very nice on sets, but mostly the crew was good. I never met a crew that was that bad. You know, they were always very nice. Costume crews are very nice. If you're doing a period piece, it's always if you're doing a film like like you're talking about medieval films, like we did, or like we like, uh, those are better to do than uh, any kind of uh, period piece is better to do than a regular film that's set in modern times because you get to wear costumes, so they treat you better. <laughs> It's, even if you're not and new. and they don't care about your costumes because I doubt back in the days that you would wear makeup and look all pretty. Well, it depends on what film you do. When we did Man in the Moon, it was a period piece because it took place in the '70s, but we were filming in the early 2000s. Well, I'm talking like a medieval one. The girls oh, back yeah, there really didn't care medieval. about perfume. As a non-union extra, if you've got to do a film and you do a period piece, it's much more fun because they they costume you, which means they give you better food and they treat you better. Because they have to keep the costumes. Oh, safe. I've been, I've been in a few. I do a haunted attraction every year, and trust me, that's costuming, that's, that's the costuming department is not always the the makeup that's department is not always that's, the that's nicest. A, that's an event. That's an event, not a film, not a film. They don't have to take the costumes back to you know the studio, but uh, they just keep them and they don't care. But because I did that too, I did the uh, haunted, the haunted hayride thing uh -huh. over in uh, over near the prison over here. I I, I I played a clown last year, a real circus clown, and I oh, cool. I made a note to you know look like a real clown. People are not scared of a clown covered in blood eating zombie parts. Okay, people are afraid of a clown, a real you know yeah. this guy's no, in the circus. Oh my God, he's a clown. I'm not afraid of clowns, but a lot of people I, are. I scared. I uh, even made worried. I don't know if the word scared, but I worried some of the other actors and act the people acting. Because yeah. they did not like circus clowns either, and here's this six foot a three circus clown. Fear. It's one of the most common phobias, but I don't have a fear of clowns, so I don't have a fear of bloody clowns for that matter, unless they're coming at me. And well, me. well, you know, my p friend pointed out. He said, "You see a clown in blood, you're gonna laugh at him." He goes, "That's what I want to see. I want to see a clown that's been stabbed and bloody." Yeah. yeah he that's goes, fun. "However, you're standing there uh, with clown makeup on. There's a picture of me on Facebook. You can go see it." I'm in real clown makeup and a real clown wig that I bought myself. It's my personal wig. Well, you know why people are afraid um, of clowns. Yeah. You know part of the reason. Not not just Stephen King. Uh, back, John Wayne Gacy was a professional clown that killed those boys. That's not yeah. the reason why. The reason why is because a lot a lot of times you're hiding your true self. I guess. And I also the colors. With the I features, never the fear of clowns. I just never understood uh, the anything. color of white with the colors. In other words, reds and blues done it. Yeah, on on a person that's not supposed to be white. If you see somebody that's white, they're either dead or sick. I guess, I guess, but that yeah. that would not be the reason I'm afraid of them. Like, 
you know, I'm not afraid of them. So, and I'm going to tell you from working for the circus, if you oh, think I they're think scary it. in their makeup, wait till you see them out backstage without it. Wait till you see oh, them, yeah. you know, camping out out back before they get in their gear. Yeah, those, the, you, I knew yeah. a couple professional clowns. I knew a couple, they were in groups. Because remember, I was working in Rocky Horror, which we put white face on. That's a Rocky Horror thing. Now, I understand Rocky Horror is supposed to be a spoof of horror movies, and people were afraid of me in the... You've seen me in the Frankenfurter yeah. costume. People freaked out for me because, again, he has a lot of blue and a lot of white. He has the white face, Tim Curry, and mm. I did the white face, and I put on the blue eyeshadow and the red, very blood-red lipstick, and he murders Eddie in the film, Rocky Horror. Yeah. Uh, so it's like people were afraid of me. I had kids running from me when I dressed up as Frankenfurter, but, again, I was never afraid of those kind of things. You know, I just wasn't. But... uh I'm afraid of certain things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a big fan of horror films. I'm not a big fan of... I don't like horror horror films, probably because of the gore and probably because it's realistic. Because of the gore. I don't like it because of the gore. I don't like something, you know, that I can watch a medieval movie where the guy gets his arm chopped off and screamed, but I think it's because I can relate it to a Dungeons and Dragons game. I can relate the Dracula... Um, uh, the, I forgot the name of the Dracula, but Peter Kushner Vlad, stars in it. Vlad the Impaler? No, Peter Kushner stars in his Dracula series. As, oh, okay. um, yeah. as the uh, uh, guy that kills Dracula there. He sure does. You're right. I did um, see that. I know what you're talking about. It's Van, based it after Van, Bram Stoker's Van, novel. Van, How Van, I, Van something? Van... Van Helsing. He stars Van as Helsing. Van Helsing. I saw the movie. Great, great and movie. the guy at Stalls as Count Dooku starred as Dracula. Yes. Yeah. Now, in this Dracula, there are very bloody scenes, but I, I, I'm fine with it. But if I go and watch, uh, you know, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Freddy Krueger, I laughed. I thought that was funny. But there's some I horror movies I see it with guts like hanging out, and I'm like, that's disgusting. That's the, disgusting. Why, why would you want to, you know? Yeah. But I could watch Game of Thrones and see all the gore because it made sense to me. Well, the Game of Thrones isn't gore. It's it, it's basically war wounds. Yes. It's not it it's not yeah. like you stab the person and blood flies all over the wall and then like intestines come out that look like, you know. And yeah. some people say some of these horror movies are slaughter films where they really did gut the person or rape the woman or whatever. Yeah, well... But they're too much for me. I don't and know I'm if they're sure. called snuff films or whatever you call them. I don't. But. They're not called snuff films. That's that's when somebody really dies. But they're called. Uh, they are called slasher slasher films. Uh, I don't like slasher films, but and horror films like that. But I'm with you. I like. I can watch a medieval. Now, film personally, I was told snuff films are fake. There is no such thing. Well, they but they say that they do that for a reason. I, I did. I had to do research on that. Uh, but little research. I wouldn't do a lot. Snuff films do exist, but they're in the black market, so they are fake, the ones you find, because they have to be fake. The ones that are real have been, you know, shut down and hunted down and all that stuff, but they used to exist. Back when uh, they have people, but they're dead people, but they get some fake ones, yeah. The ones they find are usually fake. Yeah, as far as it's, I it's not... Yeah. But I've heard of accidents on sets. Uh, what I forgot the movie... It was a horror film. It was one of those cheesy B-rated movies. Maybe you'd even call it a D-rated movie now. Yeah. Um, Where actually the guy does get cut and he's bleeding and they don't care, so they just kept filming. Oh, God. That's terrible. Yeah, Yeah, it's all that. But, you know, there's... And something about in the Child's Play movie, one of them gets cut and... Of course, we all know in uh, uh, what what movie was that. Twilight Zone. Well, uh, the Stephen King one where they went up to the mountain resort. Um, I forgot yeah. it. It's, they say red rum in it. And anyways, the blood it on is, the it's walls. Red, it's something with the red, red rose or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. The blood on the wall was not Kool-Aid. It's real blood. I guess, yeah. Like no. human blood that they got from, you know, the Red Cross. Oh, 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 that, they may have done that for effects, yeah, yeah. I now, I don't, I don't believe that's true, I don't, I don't you know, either. you take clear... I don't think he did that, so that would be a sag film. What we did is we took uh, clear uh, vegetable oil, Yeah. and we put red food coloring in it, and I then we would that. put tomato paste in it and make it look kind of chunky like real blood. 
Yeah, I've seen people who do the tomato paste mixed with, like you said, olive oil or something. Just something yeah, to do. now it's disgusting, and it's sticky, and you can't it get is, it off yourself. It's gross, yeah. But yeah. to somebody that doesn't know what it is, walking through the dark woods and a scary Halloween attraction, you're seeing oh, blood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Because, yeah. I mean, when I did the movie Rock and Roll versus the Invisible Bees, we had some special effects makeup. And it looks very real, you know, on the face and stuff. We didn't do a lot of blood and guts. It wasn't that kind of film. But it is, it's got that, you know, it's got that, uh, some effects in it. We had makeup artists who did it. It was very fun. And the film is, uh, you know, I play kind of a weird, crazy person. I don't have any special effects uh, makeup fine. But I just, uh, I'm just a little bit of a hippie lady. So I'm, it's a fun role. I can't wait for it to come out just because it'll be fun. It's on the Internet Movie Database, and so am I. My acting name is Angela Teresa Collins. My legal name uh, is Angela Teresa Egypt. That's what I do for the psychic stuff. So you can reach me, as we said, we gave, we gave the address. Uh, as for the acting, you can find me on Internet Movie Database and under Collins. Uh, and that's... Uh, Especially my internet movie database, you'll find me. I don't have my picture up there because I haven't paid for the professional service yet. But it's Rock and Roll versus the Invisible Bees, and uh, it'll be fun because, you know, you'll get to see me there. And if you watch Man on the Moon, you'll see me in the fight scene, <laughs> the fighting with women, and um, two close-ups. But I look like, uh, I just look like somebody from the 70s, but you see my face right up there. Twice. American Pie, don't blink, you'll miss me. <laughs> I missed myself. I didn't see it. And that's uh, where I am that way. I've been on some TV shows, but I can't. I don't think they air anymore. So. Well, it's been a fun time. It has been. And, you know, come on over, people. I am I have weird hours, so I can speak to anybody who speaks English, because I don't understand any other languages <laughs> when it comes to a reading. And I do past life regressions, and we'll talk. Maybe we'll talk again soon. So if you want... If you want to know anything, my phone number is 607-238-3816. My website is IamBrotherWade.com. My email, if you want to send me anything, CWLawrence at gmail.com. It's been great. Thank you. I also have classes, so please check yep. it out. And we'll see you next week, folks. Okay.